so if you take a look at the cci enterprise infrastructure uh, exam content so what we need to cover what we are going to cover here is this one cci enterprise infrastructure version 1.0 so if you click on that it will open the content in detail you can download this content from your side and keep it handy so here you can download this complete complete content and you you can keep it with yourself like uh, you can uh, have a a uh, hard copy of that so that you know what content is being covered but the entire cci enterprise infrastructure content the entire content is divided into like five parts one is network infrastructure one is software defined infrastructure second third one is the transport technology and solution uh, fourth one is infrastructure security and services and the last one is infrastructure automation and programmability so total five sections are there in the in the in the current uh, CCI enterprise infrastructure content. There are total five uh, chap five modules, if I say. Uh, first module is the network infrastructure, which is the thirty percent of the entire content, and it will cover everything from the routing point of view and switching point of view. So, from the switching point of view, first point one point one, which is switch campus, it is going to cover everything from the switching point of view, like such as switch administration, layer two protocol, VLAN technologies, Ether channel, span entry protocol. Versions of this pen entry, STP protection, and everything. So this is this is the only thing that you should know from the switching point of view in our CCI Enterprise Infrastructure curriculum. Uh, so uh, like uh, people who have already covered the switching content, uh, this part is done for them. Whoever has not covered the switching content, it will continue after this routing part. So this part is already done for like a lot of candidates in here. So switching campus part is already done. Now we will be focusing on the routing part, which is 1.2, 1.3, and so on. So 1.2 is the routing concept, uh, where we have to talk about the AD value, VRF, static routing, policy-based routing, uh, VRF-aware routing with any protocol, route filtering with any protocol, manual summarization, automatic summarization, route redistribution, routing protocol authentication, and VFT, bidirectional forwarding detection. So from the basic routing concepts point of view, these are the things that you should know. Uh, from the AD value all the way up to the BFD, so we uh, we are we are going to cover this concept of like routing concept uh, throughout the content. It's not like we are going to cover the content in sequence. So uh, like sometimes we'll talk about the AD, sometimes we'll talk about the VRF, sometimes we'll talk about the static routing. So the content is not going to cover cover like exactly in a sequence. So you have to keep an eye like what content is being covered in the exam, uh, sorry in the class, and you have to prepare it from the books and all. So under the routing concept, we have this these things, these basic things that you should know. Then we'll talk about EIGRP, adjacencies, best path selection, general operation, load balancing, EIGRP named mode, and optimization, cover, uh, convergence, and scalability in EIGRP. Things such as how can we control uh, the uh, propagation of the query message, that thing. How can we actually control the path reroute issue? Uh, what is this leak map and all? No, we do not have the Zoom link. Uh, you can rejoin once or change the browser. If anyone else is uh, uh, having any issue, let me know. Uh, for the other candidates, is the audio okay? Just confirm once. Uh, otherwise, you can. If you are facing the audio issue, it mostly uh, might be from the uh, browser point of view. You can change the browser once, and it should work fine. Audio is okay. Okay. Change the browser once. Uh, it should work fine. Or rejoin once at least. Let's see. Rejoin once and see. Uh, let's see what happens. So once we have covered everything from the EIGRP point of view, like EIGRP, basic basic things such as EIGRP adjacency, best path selection criteria, general operation, load balancing, name mode, optimization, convergence, and anything. Then we are going to talk about like once EIGRP part is done, we are going to talk about like OSPF. Right. Once this part is done, once this part is done, once the IGRP part is done, we are going to talk about OSPF, OSPF version two, and OSPF version three. Again, same thing: adjacencies, network type, path selection, general OSPF operations, uh, such as graceful shutdown, general detail, generic detail security mechanism, and all. Uh, then optimization, convergence, and scalability, like uh, metrics, LSA throttling, like LSA, LSA throttling, uh, SPF fine tuning, fast hellos, LSA propagation control, stub router, loop, LFA. Uh, prefix operation and all. So, 
these are the things that we we will cover from the OSPF point of view for IPv4 and IPv6 both, like OSPF version 2 for IPv4, OSPF version 3 for IPv6. Now, once we, did, once we are done with that, then we'll talk about border gateway protocol, BGP, IBGP, EBGP, neighborship, uh, and related concepts of neighborship like peer group, update group, templates, and all active passive state, uh, timers, dynamic neighbor, four byte AS number, private autonomous system, uh, then best path selection, where we'll talk about the path attributes and best path selection algorithm, how the load balancing will take place, routing concepts, uh, routing policies, basically, like how in BGP we can have that attribute manipulation, how can we have like a conditional root advertisement, outbound dot filtering, standard accent committees, multi homing scenarios in BGP, uh, then AS path manipulation, such as uh, local AS, allow AS, remove private AS, prependation, regular expressions, uh, convergence and scalability with the help of route reflector, uh, confederation, like uh, route reflector and confederation, we'll talk about both actually. They should have mentioned confederation somewhere, not sure, but route reflector and confederation, we'll talk both of, about both of them. Then aggregation, summarization, AS set, and other BGP features such as multipath, additional path support, uh, route soft reconfiguration, route refresh. These are the things we will talk about. Uh, once this BGP part is done, border gateway protocol part is done, then we will this this will complete our IP4 and IPv6 unicast routing. Once we are done up to this point, we'll be done with IP4, IPv6 unicast routing. Then we will talk about the multicast routing, multicast and routing. So layer two multicast where we'll talk about IGMP and layer three multicast like where we'll talk about protocol PIM, protocol independent multicast. Like for example, in the PIM, we have like a PIM version two, sparse mode, dense mode, sparse dense mode, and all the related operations we will talk about under this content. So this will be like a multicast section, very limited layer two multicast, very limited layer three multicast. Hasopnil, can you can you can you hear now properly? Is it okay now? Once that part is done. Once this is done, then we will talk about uh, this will complete like once this part is done, this will complete the routing concepts or uh, network infrastructure part. This will complete that section. So here we will mostly talk about basics of routing and the protocols such as EIGRP, OSPF, BGP for IP4 and IPv6 and the multicast routing, how the multicast routing will take place. Once this part is done, our uh, like uh, we can say that 30% of the content will be done from the network infrastructure part. And uh, then we will move on to the transport technologies and solution. In the transport technology and solution, we'll talk about things such as MPLS and DMVPN. Only two things we need to talk about, like we'll talk about MPLS and the DMVPN. Uh, we don't need to talk about other transport technologies here, uh, such as LISP or any other thing. So MPLS, again, this is not a full-fledged MPLS. This is not a full-fledged DMVPN. Uh, just basic MPLS, basic DMVPN. MPLS, general operations. And our focus in the MPLS is MPLS L3 VPN. We will not talk about uh, L2 VPN. We will not talk about other technologies, ATOM and all those things. We will not talk about traffic engineering. We will just talk about basic MPLS operation. And we will talk about the our course focus of the MPLS is going to be layer 3 VPN. C provider customer routing with the help of the layer 3 VPN. We will discuss about the layer 2 VPN, but most probably we will not see the lab part of the layer 2 VPN. If some time is left, then we will see a basic lab for the layer two VPN, not a very big lab, but uh, our course focus is purely going to be on layer two, layer uh, sorry, layer three VPN for IP4 and IPv6. Right. So uh, rest assured, they have asked like IP4 and IPv6 VPN in the exam. So you should know VPN v4, VPN v6 both from the MPLS point of view, because they have asked this in the exam as well. So this is again not a full fledged MPLS. This is just basic MPLS. Then same goes for the DMVPN. We'll talk about GRE first of all, then we'll talk about the DMVPN. Although we don't need to talk about GRE as per our content, but unless you understand the GRE, uh, DMVPN will not uh, be clear that much. So first we'll talk about GRE, problems in GRE, and then we'll talk about the DMVPN and how to secure the DMVPN with IPsec. Ideally, we should not talk about LAN to LAN IPsec because our content does not say that. Our content does not say that you need to talk about LAN to LAN IPsec. But we will we will see a basic LAN to LAN IPsec. Then we will talk about IPsec over DMVPN. How can we enable the IPsec protection on the DMVPN? Uh, then quality of service on per tunnel basis. 
So that thing we will talk about under here. Now, identify the use cases of the Flex VPN, where we will talk about type version 2. So again, this is theory part. We don't need to do anything from the configuration point of view. So identify the use cases of the Flex VPN, Ike version 2, we'll talk about like site-to-site -site VPN, server, client-side, spoke-to-spoke VPN, IPsec, Ike version 2 using pre-share key, how that happens actually, and what is the same place over Flex VPN. So we'll talk about the, like in, in theoretical part, we'll talk about the Ike version 2, and then this will complete the DMPN section as well. So the transport technology part, uh, transport technology and solution, 15% divided into two part, MPLS and DMVPN, very limited MPLS part, very limited DMVPN. Our focus earlier, it was only on the single hub DMVPN, but now we also had to talk about the uh, dual hub, dual hub single cloud DMVPN, we will talk about that. Dual hub basically means where we are going to have two uh, devices acting as the hub and multiple devices acting as the uh, branches or let's say spokes. So this will complete like 15% of the content once it is done. Then move, then we will move on to this uh, infrastructure security and services, which is again 15% content. Here, uh, for example, anyone who has covered the switching part, they must already be aware that this part is already done. We will talk about like this part. What is this URPF? What is this IP4 access list? What is this IPv6 access list? We'll talk about IPv6 first stop security features like a root a router advertisement guard. When we talk about IPv6, we'll talk about IPv6 first stop security features as well. This we will not talk about at the moment. So from this uh, from this infrastructure security and services part, we will talk about this router security feature. We'll talk about IPv6 first stop security features. Actually, these features are enabled on the switches. Like we don't enable these features on the router. So, uh, but for these features to work, you should have the understanding of the IPv6. That's why we did not cover this in the switching section. So once we are done with the IPv6 basic fundamentals, then we will talk about this IPv6 first stop security features like RA guard, DHCP guard, binding table, uh, device tracking and all those things. Then this is already done. No need to talk about that. This is one thing that we will talk about, which is quality of service. So quality of service is part of our routing curriculum. So quality of service, end-to-end -end layer three quality of service using modular quality of service CLI. We'll talk about that differentiated service, the cost model, uh, INSER model, DIPSER model, RSVP and all. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, how the mapping, how the mapping between the cost and the SCP is done, how classification is done, what is this N bar, how can we mark the packets using the IP president, the SCP and class of service bits. Uh, policy, what is this policy and shaping, condition management tools and avoidance tool, hierarchical quality of service, subrate Ethernet links. We'll talk about this in quality of service section. Then FHRP is already done, HSRP, VRRP, VLBP is already done. We'll talk about this in our IPv6 section. Like uh, DHCP, we'll talk about like in, in IPv6 as well. Uh, NAT, we will talk about. SLA, we will see in along with the static routing itself. So like this part will be covered very earlier along with the static routing. Span, R span, ER span, we have already covered. This part we have already covered in our switching section. So like I said, this part, a, a few things we have already covered in the switching section. Whoever has not covered the switching section, when we start the switching, parts such as this one will be covered there. Parts such as, for example, uh, uh, parts such as, let's say, for example, FHRP, NTP and all that, it will be covered in that one. Uh, parts such as like uh, device management and all that, it will be covered in that one. So up, up, uh, like quite a uh, significant amount of this thing is covered in the in the switching section. Right. So, uh, but like this one is covered in the switching section as well. So we will we will cover the rest of the topics here. So it will also complete the 50% a 15% uh, of it. Uh, we will not talk about the device security. Device security we'll talk about at the very end, such as AAA, dot one x and all those things. We'll talk about that at the very end. So apart from these security topics, we will cover everything here. So this is going to be the course focus. This is going to be the course focus. And this is going to be the course focus. 30%, 15%, 15%, which is approximately like 60%. Uh, I, I would say like since uh, a few things we have already covered from here. So it's like 50% uh, content we are going to cover from here. Right? This is from the content point of view. You can always download this. Just download this and keep it handy with you just to keep a track what content we have done and what content is left. So if, if you if you if you want, you can have a uh, let's say, for example, a 
a hard copy printed out for this content so that you keep a track like okay whatever whatever content we have covered right uh, one more thing so how long it is going to take to cover the entire content let me just give you a basic idea how long we are going to take uh, to complete this entire content so here the total time that it will take let me show you Mm, the total time that it is going to take, let me show you. It is going to take approximately like uh, 80, 85 classes, 72, like 75 to 80 classes. Just to give you the idea, let me show you the actual sheet. Hmm. So, this is the total like time that it will take. So, from the content point of view, uh, how long it is going to take to complete the entire content? uh starting from here this is this is only for traditional routing part so starting from here class number one introduction to routing and everything right introduction to routing routing protocol algorithm best path selection static routing and all that all the basic things then eigrp so this is this is the basics the static routing and all then one two three four five six seven eight almost nine classes for eigrp then like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, almost 12 number of classes for OSPF. Like which is uh, 3 weeks, complete 3 weeks for OSPF. One day for one LSA, one day for other LSAs. So this is the amount of, con this, is the, this is the level of detail that we will go in our OSPF content. Right? And once it is done, we'll talk about the uh, border gateway protocol or BGP. So from 28, to 47 so bgp fundamental connection types uh, uh packets ebgp neighborship gre tunnel ibgp fast like other concepts and all so we will take like 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19, 20 classes for border gateway protocol it is almost like uh, full fledged bgp but uh, it's not uh, that level of bgp like it's not uh, equivalent to the service provider bgp for example but it covers like uh, a lot of things from that so approximately 20 classes for the border gateway protocol approximately 18 to 20 classes for border gateway protocol and again this thing is from 2 hours per day classes like this is again same 8 to 10 batch 2 hours per day approximately 150 145 minutes so this is two hours, 20 classes for border gateway protocol. Then IPv6, one, two, three, four, five, approximately six classes for IPv6. Then for the VPN, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven classes for DM VPN, GRE. And then like one, two, three, four, five, six classes for MPLS VPN. Again, our content is very limited, but see, for example, here we have talked about like L2 VPN in a basics, like, but rest everything you should know. So approximately like seven, eight classes here, seven, eight classes here, we will, we will, we will have a discussion in that. Once this is done, we'll talk about uh, multicasting. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven classes for multicasting. We can cover multicasting before that as well. Like we can, we can cover like multicasting. We can cover this multicasting section after our, like, for example, IPv6 part is done before the VPN, we can cover that or we can cover it after VPN doesn't matter. Because multicasting is not going to be related to the VPN technologies. So we can cover IPv4, IPv6 unicast routing. Then we can complete the multicast routing and then we can come to the VPN. That approach we can also take. Right. And like uh, one, two, three, four, approximately five classes for quality of service. And then a few rest of the classes such as for IPv6 plus top security features and all that. So 78 classes are here. 78 classes I will need. 78 to 80, like two classes, you can include those ones as well. So approximately 80 classes you will require for the content. And this is not including a few things. Like this is like 80 pure classes we will require. 160 hours content will be required. 160 hours will be required to complete the content. Apart from that, what actually I do, uh, like for example, once we are done up to the static routing part, once we are done from here to here, uh, then we also take a look at what type of questions they have asked in the previous year exams. Uh, in our CCI enterprise infrastructure. Uh, once we go for like, once the EIGRP part is done, uh, once the OSP part is done, once the uh, BGP part is done, or let's say what I do actually, what I do, static routing, EIGRP and OSPF. When the, once these three parts are done, 
then one day we will take one complete day we will take to talk about what type of questions they have asked from the static routing ai grp and oscf point of view in our old live exam so that you get an idea that okay this type of questions uh, they will ask in the current content as well so you can you can include that one day here once we are done with bgp then we will again talk about that so you can like uh, one day for that one as well then once we are done with ipv6 part uh, and the mpls part mpls vpn gre vpn this part then we can like for more day and once we are done with that and the other part then so overall you can consider approximately 85 classes in total 85 classes 2 hours a day approximately 170 hours content is going to be there luckily like uh, at the moment there are no offs like the, the classes are going to be regular like there is no off now so the content is going to be like uh, regular so we can we can expect that it will complete in 80 to 85 classes in total four uh, four classes a week two hours a day so monday to thursday we will have the content and uh, we will we will require this much amount of classes uh, for the completion of our content once it is done then you can move on to the topics such as for example like software defined networking as the access as the van uh, then again it will require approximately uh, in the SD-WAN content. We don't cover only this SD-WAN. We cover everything about the SD-WAN. So uh, this will approximately take, again, 20, 24 classes for the SD-WAN. It will take like 10 to 15 classes for the LD access. So th the entire content is very big. That is why it's always recommended. It's always recommended that if we can do the content in parallel, that will be much more better. If you have some time, you can join other batches to complete this content like in, in parallel. Like, for example, this... Uh, uh, as the access part, you can join in weekends uh, or in other classes in parallel as the access class, as the van class, you can join in parallel. Right, so uh, so that you can cover the com content in, 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 in a little bit uh, uh, like earlier time frame. But if you if you don't have any boundation with the time, then it's okay. If you, if, you, if, you, if you have like, you know, if you want to cover the complete content and if you don't have any time restriction, then you can go like one by one as well. Ah, one more thing. Uh, this is the content that is currently there in here. Like this is the current uh, version 1.0 content that we have here. And uh, since I said it will take approximately 85 classes to complete the entire content. And uh, by the time you complete this entire content, these, these like, you know, this, this, and this part, uh, by the time you complete like rest of the contents as well, you will notice that uh, they have also scheduled to change this exam. They have also scheduled to cha change this uh, this content, this Cisco Enterprise exam update. So from September onwards, like September 20, they, they will have this version 1.1. And uh, in version 1.1, they have actually removed quite a few things. Right. So let's let's talk about that as well. Any question if you if you have from, from this point, let me know. Shekhar, I think like you had the question, one candidate who raised the hand, just, was it about the same, like, uh, Shishir, okay. Yes, yeah, Shishir, let me know. Yeah, I was going to, you know, ask about the same one, uh, 1. 1.1. Now you are going to explain the rest of the issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. We talk about that as well. From uh, 20th September onwards, they have already announced the changes, like uh, from the 20th September, this content will no longer be valid. Like they have this version 1.1 where uh, you will see some changes. So just click on this button here, learn more. We have already talked about that. There is already a YouTube video. I will just drop you a link for the same as well. So just click on here, just click on this button, learn more. And here uh, you can see that they have said that we are going to change the content in approximately every uh, three to six months now. So you can consider that uh, in every like you know uh, in every year earlier the changes used to happen in like three years three years three years time frame but now uh, they have said that the changes will happen more rapidly like uh, uh, to keep up with the changes that are in the it world so they are going to change the content in approximately like one one and a half year on a regular basis so let's say for example here uh, let's say for example in quarter two they review the certification exams in in, in one quarter then uh, they announce the changes, like they announce the blueprint changes in the other quarter, and then they publish the changes in the in the in the other quarter, and then the cycle will repeat after some time, like you know after 
uh, sometime then again like they will announce they will they will review the exam so it's approximately one year time frame so you can now expect the changes more rapidly like in one year time frame you can expect the changes that changes will now happen in approximately like one year one year time frame earlier the the, the changes used to happen in like uh, total uh, three years time frame but three years was like you know way too big so uh, now they have this they said that they are going to change the content in like one year one year time frame and the changes are not going to be very major changes like for example if they say they say that if it is version 1.1 if it is version 1.1 it is going to be less than 20 percent change but if it is like version 2 then it is going to be major change so uh, currently if you go through the contents uh, i have already explained everything let me drop you a, a video regarding the same as well i have already uh, discuss this in one of the classes just to just for your uh, detailed discussion you can refer to that uh, video let me just drop you the link there just give me a second hmm. so i have i have dropped uh, I, have, I have sent you the link in the zoom and uh, you can copy this link you can just copy this link uh, this is like uh, this is one video that I that where we have already discussed about the uh, changes and everything. It's approximately like thirty two minutes video, right? You can look at it in chain parts. So in detail, we have already discussed about this, like what changes are going to happen and everything. So you can always refer to this video uh, for for you know for very detailed discussion and all. Uh, since we are we are going to talk only and only about the uh, the. Uh, routing part today here so the content that they are they, they they are supposed to launch after 20th september is this one so this one version 1.1 so just by here i can say that it is going to be a very minor change if you click on here you can you can have the exam topics this is the exam topics that they have this is the new exam topics so here this is the new exam topic version 1.1 so you will notice that the 30% content is still the same. You will, you will find like quite a few things, like a lot of things are exactly looking like same. Here, you will not have like that uh, a difference, like, okay, what is added, what is removed. This is just like pure content. This is the same content that we have discussed. So however, they must have removed something, they must have added a few things. Anyway, the point is 30% again is going to remain there for the network infrastructure. Same thing, same thing, exactly same thing. Then the routing concepts, uh, then the EIGRP, then, for example, like uh, OSPF, then, for example, like BGP, then, uh, like, uh, if you scroll down, then it is going to be like uh, multicasting, same thing, right? Then we go for software defined access, SDX. The major change that you will notice is in this one. Earlier, the SDX and SD WAN content was very limited, but now they have added everything in the SDX part and everything in the SD WAN part. This is exactly what we cover in our content anyway. So we are already covering all these content. We are already covering everything in our content anyways. So we, we, we never, you know, conducted classes based on like uh, CCI SD access or CCI SD WAN. So we are covering everything from the SD WAN and SD access point of view anyway. So this change that, that they have done, it's, it's, it's actually nothing for us because we are already covering all these things in our, in, in our classes. So the major change that has happened, the major uh, variation that you will see is in the software defined access part. They have included quite a lot of things in this SD access and the SD main part in, in, in the newer content. And everything is already covered in our classes. So no need to worry about that. Now here they have added the GRE. So for example, like GRE tunnels earlier, it was not there, but now they have added it. MPLS, they have added it. DMVPN, they have added it. And they have removed everything else like Flex VPN and everything is no longer there. Right? Uh, similar thing like here and there a few changes are there now you just let's say for example you you want to know like what exactly has changed then what you can do you can go to the same page and here just click on this release node cci release node just click on that uh just click on that and you just uh, open this and this will tell you the difference that is there in the older version and the newer version so if you scroll down scroll down this is the changes these are the changes so earlier, Cisco SD access part was only this one, only up to this one. But now the SD access part is starting all the way from here and it goes all the way, all the way up to here. 
segmentation, handoff, deployment, fabric site, overlay, underlay, everything, everything now they have included. As the one part earlier, it was it was only this much, but now they have added see quite a lot of things in the SD WAN part. Here, all starting from here actually, as the WAN and all the way up to here, they have added quite a lot of things in the SD WAN part as well. Uh, in the transport technology, they have added point to point GRE tunnels. Uh, they have added like general in place operation, label stack, LSR. LSP, LDP, MPS ping, trace, like everything else is same, just they have just added this static and point to point GRE tunnel. They have removed this identify the use cases of the Flex VPN. So, no need to worry about that anymore. Right. So, uh, DMVPN, troubleshoot the DMVPN with layer 3, dual hub DMVPN. That's it. I, I person 2 with pre shell key only, no need for RSA signature or anything. So, they have already removed this uh, identify the use cases of the Flex VPN and everything. Uh, Partnal quality of service and everything they have removed. Then in the programming automation section, uh, they have like for example removed that uh, a few things they have removed here, like this one interaction with iOS XC API. They have removed that. They have removed that part in interaction with iOS XC API and uh, they have just like uh, interaction with vManage API, interaction with DNS Enter API. That part is as it is, but they have removed this uh, interaction with iOS XC application programming interfaces. This part is no longer there. So again, uh, they have added the YAML and Jinja to data encoding formats as well. But rest again remains the same. The point is, uh, this is very minor revision, less than 20% content has changed. Uh, from our routing point of view, uh, not a lot of things have changed. Uh, we will cover from the current content point of view, but will, it will also include everything from the new content as well. So the, like I said, major changes that have happened, it is in SD-WAN as the access part. So when you go through the SD-WAN and as the access classes, you will find that these things are already being covered. And in the routing part, in the routing part, like uh, in the routing part, we are going to actually uh, uh, focus specifically like that, since the, not a lot of things are changed, uh, we will focus specifically on the small topics. Uh, whatever changes are there, it is already covered, so no need to worry about that. Uh, automation section, uh, like uh, we have another trainer for the same, but automation section is covered uh, like in those classes. Uh, we, uh, in, in our classes at the moment, we will not cover the automation. Once the routing part is done here, we will go to the switching part, right? And then we will go to routing switching. In this like morning eight to 10 batch, mostly the routing and switching will keep on repeating. And in the, uh, after some, uh, like after any, uh, like after in other batches, like we will have the, uh, as the van, as the access, and all those parts. So we do cover automation section, but uh, uh, like not in this time. Like uh, in in some other time, weekends, weekdays, you will find the classes for the same. Uh, the link for this, you can have this. Uh, uh, I have already uh, I have sent you the link in the chat, so you can have it there. I have already sent you the link for the YouTube video. You can have that as well. So. Just go through the video, you will get the changes, you will understand the changes. A lot of things they have removed actually. They have removed quite a few things as well. Right, fast reroute and all those things they have removed actually. So just go through the video, go through the video and go through this content once and you will know like what changes they have done in our CCI exam point of view. Right, so here, these topics are removed. In the switching, we no longer have the VLAN database, we no longer have the VTP. We no longer have the VTP or VLAN database. They have added multi ether channel, which we have already talked about. Uh, in section 1.2, they have added like these two things. Uh, then whole 1.3 was removed. Like these topics are removed. Fast, fast convergence, fast reroute. OSPF version 3 address family support, they have added. Loop-free alternative in OSPF, they have removed. Uh, 1.5, this topic is removed. Multi-path, add path support. So they have they have they have they have removed quite a lot of content in the network infrastructure part as well. Then as the van part is uh, as the van as the access part is completely restructured. In transport technology, they have removed all these topics. In infrastructure and security, they have not removed anything. They have just shifted dot one x authentication to as the access part. That's why we are not going to talk about that here in our routing classes because when we cover the as the access part, this part will be covered anyway. 
Then they have added in programming automation, YAML and Jinja, and they have removed the interaction with Cisco IOS XC API. So it's more like, uh, like they have restructured the SD1 SDXS part. They have done the restructuring in this part and they have removed quite a few content. They have added only a few things in the traditional routing section. So just go through these documents so that you are prepared for the upcoming exams as well. Right? So this was just from the from the from the you know content point of view. Any doubt anyone has? This is like 30%, 25%, and 15%, which we will cover, which we will talk about in our current curriculum. Any doubts, any questions? If you have, let me know. Anything you need to discuss from the content point of view. As far as the labs are concerned, we will be able to cover all the labs in either GNS3 or even G. I will mostly do the things on GNS3 because of a few reasons, such as in GNS3, first of all, show history command I can use to show you like what commands we have configured. In even G, show history command does not work actually on these uh, uh, IOL devices actually. So I'm going to do everything on the GNS3. I will provide you all the labs uh, in GNS3. If you want to build the same labs on EVNG, you can you can build the same labs on EVNG and do whatever things we do on a regular basis. So whatever lab I covered today, let's say you have to repeat the same lab like from your side uh, at least once so that you get the understanding of the concepts. And then you can do that lab either on GNS3 or EVNG, completely your choice. I will provide you the version. Like I will give you the GNS3 files and everything. These files and everything will already be integrated with your course. So in your course, like these files, like GNS3 labs and everything will already be integrated. If you want to make those labs in the EVNG, you can make those labs on the EVNG as well. You will not require a lot of resources for the same. If you have like a 8 GB laptop, uh, that's, that will be sufficient. Like you will not require a lot of resources for the same. All the all the all the routers that we are going to use here, they are going to consume RAM. So there is no such requirement that you need to have a very high CPU for the same. So if you have sufficient, like if you have 8 GB RAM, uh, it will be more than enough for for your all the labs in the in that 50% of the content that we will talk about. All the routing, EIG, RP, OSPF, BGP, everything, everything can be done in a in a device that has like at least like 8 GB RAM. It will just be sufficient. All right, so you can build the labs. I will provide you the labs in Genus. You can build the labs in EVNG as well. And I will also provide you the uh, OVA file uh, for the older version, CCI version 5. I will provide you the document for the CCI version 5, like CCI version 5, basically the old version. I will provide you the uh, labs. Uh, there are three labs in there. So I will provide you the labs for CCI version 5 as well. I will provide you the document for CCI version 5 as well. I will discuss these documents in our classes, but I will not, of course, I will not cover the labs. There is going to be a document regarding the lab. You have to go through the document. And if you want, you can do the labs uh, all by yourself as well. That document will also have the solution. So you don't need to worry about the solution part as well. So I will provide you this CCI version 5. Uh, uh, whatever content was there in CCI version 5 is now in 60% of the current CCI exam. So whatever we are going to talk about, you can find it here in the older version of the CCI version 5. So if you want to practice on a big lab, just in case, if you want to practice on the big lab, I will also provide you this OVA file along with the documents. You can refer to the documents and then you can do the lab here as well. It is going to be a composite lab of all the technologies that you will learn throughout the content. Right, so you can practice on the same as well. There, all, there is also going to be solution for that uh, questions they have that they have asked. You can verify the solution from the same document as well. Remember that whenever we uh, whenever we discuss about the, uh, the, the 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 content, the type of questions that they ask in the exam, uh, make sure that you are present in that class at least because there is not going to be any recording for the same. So this is this is one tracker that you guys can have from the for the CCI content, CCI enterprise infrastructure content. Like the entire content, you can track whatever you have covered, whatever you have not covered from here. So for example, when we talk about switching, so these are the topics that we have in the switching section. 
So let's say one day we discuss about the managing Mac address table. Once we have discussed that, have you read the text regarding the same? If you have read the text, just check this. Have you gone through the notes or have you created some notes based on the same? Just uh, check this. This is view only, like we cannot edit it. So you have to download and then edit. It. Then have you gone through some video regarding the same? Have you done at least three labs for the same? And once you have done all that, you can just check mark it that, okay, you are ready for this content. And you can keep doing it for everything, everything that we have discussed, everything. Like, for example, when we talk about EIGRP, we'll talk about adjacencies. So, like, we will go through the documents, we will go through the video. Like, you have to go through the documents, you have to go through the video, you have to create the notes. You should do at least three labs for the EIGRP so that uh, you get a better understanding of the EIGRP adjacency topic. So, once you keep doing that, you keep doing that. Like, uh, this is more like a tracker what topics you have covered, what topics you have not covered from the CCI content point of view. And this includes everything. This includes like everything that is there in our content. So you can actually, uh, uh, I have sent you the link in the chat. You can just copy the link and you can download it once. You can download it and you can uh, paste it in the Excel. Otherwise you can just copy and paste it. You can print it, whatever, whatever suits you. Like you can just print it maybe, have, a, have, it, have it handy basically. So completely up to you, whatever you decide. But uh, I would say that you keep it with you. So that you can keep a track, like what type of things, uh, what what content you have prepared, what you have not prepared. So this is one like you know, uh, track. these are the topics that you need to review. Like you can have the text for the same, notes for the same, videos for the same. You can create short notes, basic short notes, short notes, so that you can revise everything in 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 detail. And then you had to do at least one or two laps or three laps for the same. Right. So it is a very good tracker that you can find that you can actually. Uh, download and have it with you to keep a track on all the things that uh, we cover right so all the documents and everything now uh, coming to the books we don't have any book for the cci enterprise infrastructure we do not have any book for the same uh, like for the cci enterprise infrastructure we do not have any official certification guide the official certification guide from cisco is is more like a lab guide the guide that is, uh, I think, uh, Enterprise Infrastructure Foundation, uh, something like that. So that that guide is actually more like a lab oriented guide. There is no theory in that. So in that uh, official Cisco certification guide that they have, there we do have just the like just the labs, no theory at all. So the point is like here, uh, we do not have any official certification guide for this content. So you have to rely on the old content books for the same. So all the documents that are needed will be shared with you again on the portal basis. So on the same portal from where you have joined the classes, uh, I will share a few documents on the same. And you can refer to those documents for the enterprise infrastructure preparation. Documents such as, for example, these. Documents such as, for example, these that we will, that we will use in our content. Such as, for example, routing and switching guide this uh, uh, this is the old guides that we have, like we have this routing and switching version five official certification guide, volume one, volume two. This is the old volume. So, but you will have like uh, everything that we should know from the switching IGP point of view. So you can have this uh, old version CCI routing and switching version five book for the same, right? You can also have this uh, uh, this the same 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 type of document that you saw. This is here as well. This is more like a learning metric. All the topics that we have to talk about, it is there as well. There are some links that you can refer for the documentation purpose. So this is also this will also be shared with you, so so that you can read the things from the let's say for example some some websites and all as well. So you can you can go through that one as well. Uh, then we have the old TCP/IP volume one and volume two, just in case if you want to study in very much detail. For example, you want to study about BGP in very detail. Go through this routing TCP IP volume two, uh, Jeff Doyle. So this is like uh, one, two, three, four, five chapters for BGP uh, multicasting. This book is purely BGP multicast. And then we have volume one where we where they have talked about like rest of the things, the the traditional part of it basically, the traditional part routing basics, routing protocols, and everything. So TCP IP volume one, volume two. 
these are the books that you can refer to as well then we have mpls mpls like when we study mpls we will have this mpls guide volume 1 so you will study mpls from here from this content uh, then you will go for quality of service when we go for vpn we will go through this book uh, from the vpn point of view so the point is we have quite a couple of books that we have to go through for the entire uh, you know content in detail here uh, this is this is the uh, this is like a vpn book including the labs and everything this is specifically for security candidates but uh, since we still have like a few things in our content you can refer to this book as well this is ios vpn guide then we have ip telephony for quality of service when we talk about quality of service we will talk about the quality of service from this book so we are going to cover like topics from these different different books then we have like uh, some configuration regarding i version 2 let's say you want to quickly refer to i version 2 configuration just basic i version 2 configuration parameters are there so uh, these all things will be shared with you in fact the new enterprise infrastructure foundation book will be shared with you as well this is the new enterprise infrastructure foundation book and you can see here this is not a theory book this is pure lab go to the switching lab 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 there is no theory in this so you can also refer to this for your lab task like this is this is this is one workbook that you can consider you can create this topology in evng and you can do the labs based on the questions based on the task that they have here this is the official certification book from cisco itself for the cisa enterprise infrastructure foundation but i'm not sure like should i say unfortunately but this is only for the lab this is only for the lab this is not the theory one so like for example we are already done with the switching go through it go through it and com complete the trunks complete the ether channel complete the uh, stp and everything as per this book complete it when we when we talk about uh, rip you don't need to worry about the same no need to worry about rip eigrp when we talk about eigrp configure eigrp in this topology create this topology and configure eigrp in this topology so this is more like a lab oriented book here in in this one we do have the sd wan as the access part as well so as the wan as the access part as well. very limited but we have this thing. and this is what you should know from the content point of view this is what they expect you to know from the content point of view so this book will also be shared it is more like a lab workbook that you can refer to from your a uh, lab point of view so all the things that we will cover in the class after that if you want to do a separate lab you can build this lab for example and you can do the lab on your gns or even the platform these this is going to be task oriented workbook so task task there is a task configure this uh, do this you have to do this and you do you have to take these restrictions do not configure the network command loopback interface should be advertised with the correct mask and everything so task and uh, you have to go through this all that and uh, you know you can complete all the things regarding for example ospf from here bgp from here as well so this is more like a lab oriented book that you can so this will also be shared with you uh, in a few days like once it is final like for the number of candidates that will join this all documents will be shared with you on the same portal you can download all these things. here we also have the content the official content that we have right so yeah that's from the book point of view again any doubts anyone let me know we have talked about the content we have talked about the labs we have talked about the books we have talked about the timing we have talk, talked about the total number of classes uh, how we can keep a track on the content and everything that part is now done any question if anyone has so far let me know any doubts anyone so far let me know anyone if I, you have any question let me know otherwise we are good to start the content from this routing section any doubts if you guys have let me know So up to, uh, up to this point, we have already covered in our previous switching classes. This is where we left, and this is what we will start now. So once we are done with the routing, then again we will come back to the switching 
So if you have not covered these, you will cover there in the switching classes. So this is done. Up to this part is done. Now we will start the IP routing fundamental. This PPT will also be shared to you. Uh, this PPT will also be shared to you on again the portal where you can refer to these uh, PPTs, whatever we are going to cover in a regular basis. Uh, any SDX batches in upcoming days? Uh, I'm not sure in the weekend as the access batch is already going on. So in the weekend after the SDX batch, we will start the SD band in the weekends. But uh, in the regular time or the other time slot, I'm not aware. Uh, you can have a dis uh, you can you can drop a message to Mr. Sugan and Saurabh, and they will they will they will respond to the same. In the weekend, when we are done with the SD access batch, then we will talk about the SD band there, and then most probably we'll start the SD access there again. Uh, but at the moment, like there is no batch planned for the same. All right. So uh, if you guys don't have any question, let's talk about uh, routing fundamentals in brief. Uh, what is routing, how the routing works in between two, two or more devices, what are the protocols, what are the algorithms that we use in the routing. You will get the recording after the classes, I think like 30-40 minutes after the classes, uh, you can refer to the recordings as well uh, for the discussion that we have done in the classes. And if you, if you have any question uh, in, in the class, you can again same, click on the raise hand button or you can just drop a message in the chat or if you have the classes if, if you have any 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 doubts or anything after our class ends then you can have a discussion the next day as well all right so let's start with the some basics of the routing so what exactly is routing routing is a process of moving the packets from one network to another network so we have one network one local area network uh, that is having some particular set of addresses, such as starting from 10.10.10. .10 and we have to forward those messages to another local area network uh, that is that is having the addresses starting from 10.10.11. .10 so we have a group of devices uh, where the netter part is starting from 10.10.10. .10. We have a group of devices where the netter part is starting from 10.10.11. .10 Basically, these are two different networks. We have one local area network. We have second local area network. Now we want to send some packet from one local area network to another local area network. So uh, the process of sending the packets from one network to another network is what we refer to as routing. So routing is a process of moving the packets from one to another network. And all the devices, all the devices that can move the packet from one network to another network based on one network to another network based on IP address, all those devices are said to be routing capable devices. Any device that is capable of moving the package from one network to another network based on IP address, based on layer three address, those devices are called as the layer three devices, layer three uh, or routing capable devices or the devices that operate at layer three of the OSI or TCP IP model. And most commonly utilized device that we use for routing purpose this process from this process of moving the packets from one network to another network is what we refer to as routing. So routing is a process of moving the packets from one network to another network, and whatever devices are capable of doing that process are called or are said routing capable devices. Uh, most commonly used routing capable device is called a router. So router is a most commonly utilized routing capable device. Apart from that, we also have in the modern day network we have those layer three switches. We also have like firewalls. We have quite like a lot of other devices as well where we can perform the routing. Basic, basic routing functionality you will see nowadays in almost all the devices, such as routers, such as firewalls and other devices as well. But uh, a router is one of the most popular device that we use to route the packet from one network to another network. So router is said to be a layer three device, a device that operates at layer three of the oversight model which is responsible of moving the packets from one network to the network based on the IP address. Uh, one thing you should also remember that the router performs uh, routing or the router performs packet forwarding based on destination IP address. Uh, uh, the routing that we perform in the normal network is done based on the destination IP address, like destination based routing. Destination based routing we perform in the normal uh, enterprise infrastructure. 
So the packet, when it arrives on the router, the router is going to take a look at the destination IP address and based on the destination IP address, the packet will move from one interface to another interface. Based on the destination IP address, the packet will move from one interface to another interface. Uh, routers uh, typically do not perform source-based routing. But we have the capability, we have the capability uh, or the routers have the capability to perform routing based on source address as well. Means when the packet arrives, when the packet arrives on the router interface, a router is not only going to look at the destination IP, it is also going to look at the source IP or it can just look at the source IP and based on that, it can perform the routing of the packet from one network to another network. So these devices are capable enough of performing the routing based on both source IP address and the destination IP address. By default, they perform the packet forwarding based on destination IP address. We can make them, we can make these routers, we can make this router, for example, forward the packet based on the source IP address as well. What do we call that? What do we call? What do we call when a router performs packet forwarding based on source IP? How can we do that? How can we tell the router when? How can we do the? How can we uh, tell the router that you had to take a look at the source IP of the packet, and based on that you had to uh, forward the packet out of either this interface or out of this interface? You might already be aware of that. So. Yes, that is called policy based routing. So we can we can we can purposefully we can instruct the router that okay, you know, you're not only going to look at the destination IP, or in fact, you are not even going to look at the destination IP. You are going to perform the routing as per my policy that I have configured here. And my policy says take a look at this source IP. If the packet is coming from this source IP, place it onto this interface. If the packet is coming from a this from this source IP, do one thing, place it on this interface. So ideally, ideally, the routers, ideally these devices, they perform the routing based on a layer three address, that is destination IP address. They're layer three, like destination layer three address, like destination IP address. But we can make these devices uh, forward the packet based on other criteria as well, such as source IP. So these routers can also forward the packet based on the source IP address. Uh, but for that, we need to do some configurations on the same. And uh, the configuration that we need to do on the same is referred to as policy-based routing, where we will configure the policy as per our requirement. And the policy is going to say that if you have this IP as the source IP, forward the packet out of this particular interface. And if you have this IP as the source IP, forward the packet out of this particular interface. So policy-based routing or PBR, policy-based routing is one thing that we can enable on these routers to forward the packet based on our predefined policy, the policy that can include such as source IP address in the forwarding decision. So uh, routing is a process of moving the packets from one network to the network. Typically, this packet forwarding is done based on the destination IP address. Uh, all the devices that perform packet forwarding from one network to another network based on the destination IP address are called layer three devices. Most commonly utilized layer three device is called a router. A router is a most commonly utilized layer 3 device that moves the packet from one network to another network based on destination IP address. However, on these routers, you can also set up things such as policy-based routing, where the packet will move based on the defined policy that we have configured. And this policy can include things such as like source IP address. So the router is not only going to look at the destination IP, but it can also look at the source IP address while deciding where to place the packet. So IP-based uh, forwarding, packet forwarding. IP-based packet forwarding is done by these routers. Apart from that, what else? What else? What other type of forwarding these devices can do? These devices can forward the packet based on destination IP address. These devices can do the packet forwarding based on the source IP address. What other types of packet forwarding these devices can do? These devices, these routers can also forward the packet from one interface to other interface based on something called labels as well. So labels based packet forwarding, they can also do. Uh, this is very commonly used in the protocol such as multi-protocol label switching or MPLS. So MPLS, MPLS multi-protocol label switching is a technology as well, 
where the packet forwarding is done based on labels, not based on the IP address. Uh, why you should know that? Because we are going to cover MPLS later on in our config. So you should know that the devices can not only take their forwarding decision based on the IP address, but the devices can also take their forwarding decision based on something called labels. There could be other techniques as well. No, we don't need to discuss that, but there could be other techniques as well. Based on that, the devices can decide to forward the packets from one network to another network or from one interface to other interface. So uh, from the routing point of view, routing is a process again of moving a packet from one network to another network based on destination IP address. And all the devices that perform routing, they are called layer three devices or routing capable devices. Most commonly utilized layer three device is called a router. Now routing is done in two places. Routing is done within the, within the organization or within the, what we say as autonomous system. And routing can be done in between two different autonomous system. So we have one autonomous system. We have a second autonomous system. What is this autonomous system? A network of interconnected routers and related systems managed under a common network administration is known as AS. Basically, a group of routers and related components like routers such as firewall, access point, WLC, all those, all those like part of uh, which are being managed by a common administrative authority, which are being managed by a common organization, let's say, for example, is what we are going to refer to as an autonomous system. So an autonomous system is a group of devices under a common administration. These devices includes routers such as firewall, access point, WLCs and other devices. So a group of devices under a common administrative authority is what we refer to as an autonomous system. A group of devices under a common administrative authority is what we refer to as an autonomous system. There could be like a lot of devices here. There could be a lot of devices here. These devices will be interconnected to each other. Uh, let's say, for example, in this fashion, we need to route the packet from one network to the network. So we need to perform routing here. We need to route the packets from one network to another network. So we need to perform routing here. And we might also want to perform routing in between the autonomous system if we want to route the packet from here to, let's say, for example, here. So routing is done within the autonomous system and the routing is done in between the autonomous system. One is referred to as intra autonomous system routing and one is referred to as inter autonomous system routing. Intra autonomous system routing is done when we perform the routing within the autonomous system and inter AS routing is done when we perform the routing in between the autonomous system. An autonomous system is also referred to as a routing domain because typically, typically in one autonomous system, we are going to have one routing protocol sharing all the route information. Typically, it's not always mandatory. We can have more than one protocols as well, but typically in an autonomous system, we will see one routing protocol sharing the route information. That's why one autonomous system is also referred to as one routing domain. So a network of a group of a network of interconnected routers and related systems managed under a common network administration is known as an autonomous system or also referred to as routing domain. We might need to perform the routing within the autonomous system. And we might, we might need to perform the routing in between the autonomous system. Let's say, for example, there are two organizations. Uh, they have done the routing within the autonomous system. And uh, they got, let's say, for example, merged together. So now the traffic from this, uh, this organization needs to pass to this organization. This is running, let's say, autonomous system number 100. This is running, let's say, autonomous system 200. So we might also need to run the routing in between the autonomous system 100 and 200. So routing needs to be done. Routing uh, might need might need it to be done like intra and inter in both the situation. And these are very commonly protocols, very commonly utilized protocols that we need to perform routing that we use to perform the routing uh, intra or inter autonomous system. RIP routing information protocol represent to EIS, ERP, OSPF, ISIS, BGP. These are a few protocols that we can use to perform routing within and in between the autonomous system. Apart from that, we also have the static routing. In case of static routing, routes information will be entered by the on the router manually 
But in case of dynamic routing, we are going to use protocols such as RIP, such as EIGRP, such as OSPF, such as ISIS, such as BGP. We are going to use these protocols uh, to perform the routing in between or within the autonomous system. Right, so static routing, manual configuration, dynamic routing, route chain permission will be exchanged automatically from one point to other point. So th the point is, whenever a device receives a packet, when this router receives a packet, the packet has a particular source IP, the packet has a particular destination IP, which indicates that the packet is going from here to here. Now this router, in order to perform routing, in order to perform routing, this router must have a route in its routing table. This router must have a route in its routing table. This router must know how can I reach to that destination. If I need to go to this destination, should my exit interface be like FA0 by 1 or uh, this should be like FA0 by 2. This router needs to know, this router needs to know that if I want to go to this destination, should I place the packet onto this interface or should I place the packet onto this interface. And just to just to know that, just to know like which what is the exit interface, what is the interface where we need to place the packet in order to reach to that destination, just to know that it, it has to know that somehow it has to know that it down this router has to know that if I have to go to this destination, I have to exit out of this particular interface. Just to know that, just to know this information, uh, this router is going to maintain a table. This router is going to maintain a table of all the known destinations that it is aware of. This router is going to maintain a table that is referred to as a routing table. In the routing table, it is going to maintain the information about all the known destination. These destinations could be directly connected. These destinations could be learned via some protocol such as EIGRP, such as OSPF, doesn't matter. But uh, these, these, this routing table is going to hold this thing called routes. In the routing table, we are going to have routes. Routes are going to represent a path to reach to a certain destination. So if you want to go to this destination, our routing table says that if you want to go to this destination, you have to place the packet on the exit interface of 0 by 2. So now the router is going to take a look at the routing table, find out the exit interface is 0 by 2, and it will place the packet from this interface to this particular interface. So routers, they look up. This, this, this is what we say. When the packet arrives on the router interface, the packet has a particular IP as the destination IP. A router needs to know what is the exit interface to reach to that destination IP. So router is going to perform a routing table lookup. Router is going to look up the routing table to find out what is the exit interface to reach to that particular destination. Router performs routing table lookup to find out what is the exit interface to reach to that destination. And when the router performs the routing table lookup, it will find out that to go to that destination, we have to exit out of the interface FA0 by 2. And that is when the routing will take place. That is when the router is going to take the packet and place it from FA0 by 0 to FA0 by 2 towards the destination point. So the point is moving the packets from one interface to the interface based on the destination IP is what we refer to as routing. So routing is a process of moving the packets from one interface to the interface based on the destination IP and router takes the helps from routing table to perform this routing process. So router must have a route in the routing table in order to identify what is the exit interface to reach to that destination. And this is the only thing that the router cares about. The only thing that the router needs to know what is the exit interface where I need to place the packet in order to send it towards the destination. That is the only thing that the router cares about. As long as there is a route in the routing table that tells the router that this is the exit interface where th this is the exit interface where I should place the packet, it will be okay. It doesn't need, it does not need any other information. The only thing that the router cares about is the exit interface to reach to a certain destination. If the router has the information in its routing table on how to reach to a certain destination, Basically, what is the exit interface to reach to at that destination? It will be basically okay. It will not require any other information for the same. So in my routing table, I must have the route. In my routing table, I must have the route in order to route the packet from one interface to other interface. 
how we are going to have the routes in my routing table. So let's say, for example, this is the router. And uh, these are like all the directly connected subnets. Let's say this is 10.1.1 .1 .1 slash 24. This is 10.1.1 .1 slash 24. This is 10.1.3.1 slash 24. These are the IP addresses that we have configured on the router 4.1 slash 24. These are the IP addresses that we have configured on four interfaces of the router. Let's say FS0 by 0, let's say FS0 by 1, let's say FS0 by 2, and let's say FS0 by 3. Let's say a router has four interfaces, and all, on all those four interfaces, we have configured the IP address. As soon as we configure the IP address on a router interface and issue the no shutdown command, the router is automatically going to take a look at the IP address that we have configured. And it is going to take a look at the subnet mask that we have configured. It is going to perform some logical and operation, and it will find out the route. Remember that the router is not going to maintain indivisible IP information in the routing table. The routing table will always contain routes, and routes are going to be network ID and subnet mask. Always going to be network ID and subnet mask. The router is not going to maintain indivisible IP information in the routing table. Router is not going to maintain that if you need to go to 10.1.1.1, it is connected on FS0 by 0. Router is not going to maintain that 10.1.2.1 is connected on FS0 by 1 or something like that. Instead, as soon as we configure the IP address and subnet mask on the router interface, as soon as we configure IP address and subnet mask on the router interface, the router is going to take a look at this IP address, router is going to take a look at the subnet mask, router is going to perform the logical end operation and it will get the result and it will install that result in the routing table. It says that if you need to go to 10.1.1.0 destination, if you need to go to any IP from 10.1.1.0 to 10.1.1.255, you need to exit out of the interface FA 0 by 0, which is just another way of saying that if you need to go to this network, you need to exit out of the interface FA 0 by 0. As soon as we configure the IP address on here, as soon as we configure the IP address on the other interface, uh, it is again going to maintain the information in the routing table that if you need to go to this network, you need to exit out of this particular interface. Again, 10.1.3 and then so on. So as, as we keep configuring the IP address on the router interfaces, the router is automatically going to maintain the routes in the routing table. Basically, since we have configured the IP address on the router interface, the router knows that this network is connected on FA0 by 0, this network is connected on FA0 by 1, this network is connected on FA0 by 2, and this network is connected on FA0 by 3. How or why, why the router knows about all these directly connected subnets? Because we, as an administrator, have configured the IP addresses on these router interfaces. So a router will always perform the routing for the directly connected destinations. It does not need any of these protocols. It does not need static routing. It does not need anything in order to route the packet from one network to another network that is directly connected to it. A router does not need static routing. A router does not need any dynamic routing protocol in order to route the packet between directly connected network. So if you want to go from here to here, and these two networks are directly connected to the router, the routing can just take place directly without any, without the help of any routing protocol or without the help of, let's say, static routing. No need of a static routing, no need of any dynamic routing protocol for the same. But it's not like uh, there is a single router on the internet or it's not like there is a single router in your company. There are multiple routers on the company. This is one router of your company that knows about these three networks. There is a second router in this company that knows about these two networks. There is a third router in the company that knows about these three networks. And we have connected all these uh, routers together so that we can route the packet from this network to this network. We want to send the traffic from this uh, network to this network. But the problem is router one has no idea how to reach to the destination B. It has no idea how to reach to the how to reach to that destination B. This router has no idea how to reach to the destination A and B. This router has no idea how to reach to the destination A. Why? Because this router only knows about its directly connected subnets. 
this router only knows about its directly connected subnet and by default this router knows about all it only and only its directly connected subnets so router 1 has no idea how to reach to b router 3 has no idea how to reach to a router 2 has no idea how to reach to a and b and that is why your packet cannot go from this machine to this machine because when the packet arrives on router 1 router 1 has no route in its routing table router does not know what is the exit interface to reach to that destination so the router is just going to drop the packet it's not a switch if it was a switch switch would have flooded that frame out of all the interfaces except for the interface where the frame was received but it is not a switch it is a router if a router finds no route in the routing table to reach to a certain destination it is just going to drop that packet it is just going to drop that packet it is not going to it is not going to uh, flood or do anything similar to that it's not going to do that it is just purely going to drop the packet so in short in order for the router to route the packet from one interface to the interface there has to be a route in the routing table this router must know that in order to reach to this destination the packet has to move from this interface to this interface then this router must know that in order to reach to this destination the packet has to move from this interface to this interface then this router must know that in order to reach to this destination the packet has to move from this interface to this interface basically all these routers must have the routes in their routing table in order to successfully route the packets from one source to a particular destination and that is exactly where these uh, routing protocols or the static routing comes into the picture who how this router will know about these destinations either we are going to give the router that information manually or the routers can exchange that information automatically with the help of these protocols so when we as an administrator give the information manually it is what we refer to as a static routing we are telling the router uh, on how to reach to this destination we are telling the router that if you have to go to this destination this is your exit interface that is what we refer to as a static routing but if you are using a protocol to exchange the route information automatically from one router to another router then this is what we refer to as the dynamic routing in the dynamic routing route information gets exchanged between the routers automatically in dynamic routing we require some protocols to perform the routing this route information will be exchanged to other router with the help of some protocol this route information will be exchanged with the help of some routing protocol to another router so we require this uh, dynamic routing protocol we require these dynamic routing protocols we require these dynamic routing protocols in order to route the packets from one network to another network in an automated fashion otherwise you can perform the routing all by yourself using the static routing okay any doubts anyone let me know so far any questions anyone if anyone has any question you can again same either raise hand or drop the message in the chat just in case so if you are going to do the static routing it's okay for a small scale network if you have like two four routers a few destinations then it's okay for two four routers of small destination a small network it's okay but if you have like a big campus area network a big uh, large enterprise network a service provider network a data center and so on so there performing the static routing might not be that much useful specifically in the enterprise network or the service provider network so uh, these protocols actually can be used to exchange the route information automatically from one router to another router and out of these protocols some protocols are designed to operate within the autonomous system and these are referred to as integrated gateway protocols and some protocols are designed to work in between the autonomous system which are referred to as exterior gateway protocols so those protocols that are designed to operate within the autonomous system they are referred to as interior gateway protocols protocols that other than bgp protocols other than bgp protocols other than bgp all these protocols like rip eigrp ospf and isis all these protocols are designed to work within the autonomous system as uh, so that they are called igp or integrated gateway protocol 
Interior gateway protocols are those protocols that are designed to operate within the autonomous system. In short, those protocols which are used to perform intra AS routing are referred to as IGP protocols. And the protocol that is responsible to perform the routing in between two autonomous systems, that is what we refer to as exterior gateway protocol. Exterior gateway protocols are designed to route the traffic between two different autonomous systems, and VGP is mostly used for exterior gateway routing. Uh, other than BGP, we used to have the protocol called EGP, exterior gateway protocol. Before that, we had the protocol called GGP, gateway to gateway protocol. We had other protocols as well. But nowadays, the only protocol that we use for exterior gateway routing to perform the routing within the uh, in between the autonomous system, that is what we refer to as BGP or border gateway protocol. So BGP or the border gateway protocol is used to define, it is used to configure the routing between two different autonomous systems. BGP can be used as exterior gateway routing protocol. We can also use BGP within the autonomous system as well. So BGP has two flavors. One is called eBGP, one is called iBGP. eBGP, when we need to perform the routing between the autonomous system and iBGP, when we need to perform the routing in the same autonomous system. So BGP can be used in both the situation. Like within the autonomous system, we can use BGP and in between the autonomous system, we can also use border gateway protocol. However, remember, that border gateway protocol is designed to operate in between the autonomous system. BGP is designed to operate as an inter AS routing protocol, but we can also configure BGP within the same autonomous system as well. In between the autonomous system, uh, BGP will work perfectly. Within the autonomous system, it can also work. Uh, one is called interior like IBGP and one is called like eBGP, internal and external border gateway protocol. Now, these protocols that they have, like these protocols that we have actually, out of these protocol RIP, you will most commonly not use in the in the in a production environment. However, there are still a lot of devices that only support routing using RIP. So, uh, if you have a device that only supports RIP routing, or in your infrastructure you have a few devices that are very old devices and they only support the RIP routing, then unfortunately you will have the only protocol to run in your infrastructure. RIP version 2, it has its, its own disadvantages. So RIP version 2 is not a very popular protocol to be used as a routing protocol in the network. Apart from that, we have EIGRP, OSPF, and ISIS. ISIS, you will mostly see in the service provider environment to perform the routing between the devices. OSPF, you will see as a link state routing protocol, mostly in the enterprise network to perform the routing. And EIGRP, you will also see as an interior gateway protocol, as a distance filter solution to perform the routing within the enterprise network. Uh, like EIGRP, uh, out of all these protocols, uh, if someone says like which protocol is the best one to perform the routing within the autonomous system, uh, like uh, some people consider that OSPF is the best one, some people consider that EIGRP is the best one. Uh, so in an enterprise network, when we need to perform the routing within the autonomous system, we have the option of EIGRP and OSPF both. Comparatively, if we compare the features of EIGRP and OSPF, you will find that actually EIGRP is much more better, faster, and has a lot more advantages as compared to OSPF and ISIS. So uh, EIGRP like, uh, is, 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 is a better choice to run as an IGP protocol in your production environment within the autonomous system. However, the problem with the EIGRP is that uh, it was a proprietary protocol for a very long time. I believe it was created approximately like if I'm not wrong, uh, EIGRP was created around like 1992. And since like 1992 to all the way up to 2013, it was a proprietary protocol. That means you can run EIGRP only on Cisco devices. So if you have Cisco devices, actually EIGRP is the best protocol that you can implement to perform the routing within the autonomous system. It is. It has a few features that is not there, that are not there in the OSP protocol, that is not there in the ISIS protocol, such as like uh, a feasible successor, such as such as uh, unequal cost load balancing. Uh, there is also a feature referred to as EIGRP over the top or OTP, which allows EIGRP to form the EIGRP adjacency on the top of another protocol, such as OSPF. So EIGRP adjacency can be formed on the top of other protocol as well, which is what we refer to as EIGRP OTP. So they have enhanced EIGRP very much. They have enhanced EIGRP 
to run in a in a in a campus area network in a in an enterprise network to perform the routing within the autonomous system they have enhanced the igrp uh, to handle like bandwidth up to like 4.2 terabits per second uh, they have they have they have they have enhanced the igrp very much so eigrp actually is the best protocol that you can have if you have all the cisco devices in your production environment but if you do not have cisco devices in your production environment then the other protocol that you can go for is the ospf ospf is going to be the next best protocol that you have uh, if you do not have like uh, cisco devices in your enterprise network or if you are using cisco juniper both for example you cannot actually use eigrp on juniper devices so the only option that will be left is like uh, ospf although eigrp went open standard in 2013 like in 2013 cisco announced that uh, they are openly releasing the eigrp protocol there is a there is an there is a there is an rfc called a draft uh, uh, savage rfc uh, this is an official documentation uh, for the eigrp that you can find on the internet on itf website uh, savage is the name uh, of the engineer like who has published this uh, documentation to the internet so uh, draft savage rfc is one rfc that you will find on the internet that includes everything you need to know about the eigrp so nowadays like nowadays like uh, vendors can implement eigrp in their own uh, uh, like operating system as well like for example juniper junos they can they have the option to implement eigrp in their operating system huawei uh, uh, cisco alcatel all these do, all these routers that we have they have nowadays option to implement eigrp in their operating system however no one has done that like you will not find the igrp in any of these vendors they do have the option to implement it but they have not done it uh i am personally not aware of any other vendor where you can see a protocol eigrp being implemented juniper is not having that uh, other huawei i think huawei has a similar protocol to eigrp but they do not have eigrp exactly as it is other vendors like uh, i think like uh, uh in one or two devices you might find the igrp but other than that you will not find the igrp anywhere actually so up to 2013 up to 2013 eigrp was cisco proprietary protocol that means only cisco had the right to implement the igrp but after 2013 this eigrp has become more like a cisco only protocol that means like other vendors have the option to implement it but they have they have they have chosen not to implement it so this protocol is only implemented on cisco even nowadays so it's been approximately like 10 years since this uh, uh, eigrp has gone open standard but since like uh, since then no one has actually implemented the eigrp in their operating system and uh, like uh, see ospf is already running modern day routers are capable enough of handling ospf updates database and everything so we actually do not need any other protocol to perform the routing within the autonomous system however we are losing a few advantages that we have in the eigrp but we are also gaining a few advantages such as traffic engineering eigrp lacks any sort of traffic engineering feature that is why eigrp is not a preferred choice to be used as an igp protocol in the service provider environment where things such as traffic engineering where we want to move our traffic as per our requirement is needed in a service provider environment eigrp is not a preferred choice because eigrp lacks any type of traffic engineering features features that are available in ospf and issis protocol features that are available mostly in the issis protocol a few features are there in the ospf as well so ospf can be used in enterprise network issis can be used in an enterprise network eigrp can also be used in an enterprise network if you have cisco devices uh, they you will mostly go for the eigrp protocol and if you have like other vendor devices you can go for protocol such as ospf and issis issis you will mostly see in the service provider environment but like production environment your enterprise infrastructure can also include issis in their internal routing and since nowadays we are talking about things such as dns center we are talking about uh, uh, like uh, software defined access technology you will notice that uh, uh, when we implement as the access using the dns center you will notice that the issis protocol will be used automatically there uh, to build the network uh, via dns center 
So even in nowadays in the enterprise network, even nowadays in the enterprise network, you will see these uh, this protocol such as ISIS being used as the IDP protocol to make the reachability between the devices of your campus network. But again, ISIS is a very common protocol, very normally very well utilized protocol in a service partner environment. And OSPF is a very commonly utilized protocol in the enterprise environment. If you have like Cisco proprietary protocol, if you have like Cisco devices, you can go for Cisco proprietary protocol. Or if I say Cisco only protocol, PIGRP. And if you have a very old device or a device that only supports rerouting, then only you will go for this rerouting protocol. And all these protocols are designed to perform well within the autonomous system. All these protocols are designed to act as an IGP protocol. If you want to perform the routing between the autonomous system, then the only choice that you get is the border gateway protocol uh, and the specifically BGP version 4. So current BGP version is BGP version 4 that we use to perform the routing in between the autonomous system. But BGP can also be used to perform the routing within the autonomous system. However, it is remember IGP protocols are called IGP protocols because they are designed to operate within the autonomous system. EGP protocol is called EGP protocol because it is designed to operate in the in between the autonomous system. If you are going to use an IGP protocol as an EGP protocol, or if you are going to use EGP protocol and IGP protocol, you might face a few challenges. So since this protocol is labeled as EGP protocol, it should be used as EGP. Since these protocols are labeled as IGP protocol, they should be used to perform the routing within the autonomous system. We should not use IGP protocols as EGP and we should not use EGP protocols as IGP unless there is a specific requirement for the same. So what I'm saying, it's not like we cannot configure OSPF in between them. It's not like that. we can configure OSPF in between them. This is one autonomous system. This is another autonomous. We can configure OSPF, EIGRP, ISIS, uh, RIP, in fact, in between them. It is completely possible, but we should not. There are limitations in these protocols, uh, limitations that are uh, that are that are well known, that are suitable enough uh, for IGP environment. So you should consider using these protocols only as IGP. When it comes to EGP, you should go for this border gateway protocol, and vice versa. You should not use BGP in the in the internal environment unless there are certain requirements for the same. When should we use a BGP as an IGP protocol? We will talk about that in our BGP section. But uh, as long as possible, configure an IGP, configure an EGP. Now, all these protocols that we have here, such as RIP, EIGRP, OSP of ISIS, BGP, they work on different, different algorithms. We'll talk about that. So both EGP and IGP, they have different algorithms, such as uh, Different algorithm for best path selection, such as distance vector algorithm, enhanced distance vector algorithm, link state algorithm, path vector algorithm. Like all these protocols that we have talked about, like EGP and IGP protocol, they have different different algorithms based on which they decide their best path. Algorithms such as distance vector algorithm, such as link state algorithm, such as enhanced distance vector algorithm, such as path vector algorithm. All these protocols have different different algorithms that we will discuss next. So when a router receives a route from various path, it will select the best path and it will install that path in the routing table. And that best path will be used to route the packet from one network to another network within the autonomous system and in between the autonomous system. And it uses a few criteria to decide which path is the best path to install in the routing table. We will talk about that later on as well. So just to give you the idea, this is one autonomous system running OSPF as an IGP protocol, second autonomous system running EIGRP as an IGP protocol, third autonomous system using IVGP as IGP protocol, and in between, we have configured BGP as EGP protocol. So if you want to communicate from here to here, it is possible because Border Gateway Protocol has exchanged the routes from one autonomous system to other autonomous system. So the packet can be routed respectively from one source to a particular destination. So both IGP and EGP work together to create a very big routing environment 
so that we can route the packet from a source to a particular destination. Now we will talk about our algorithms that these protocols, these routing protocols actually use. Uh, we'll talk about the algorithms in our next class. So far, if you have any question, you can ask any doubts if you have, we can ask. In last class, we're talking about these IGP and EGP protocols. So we discussed that there are two types of protocol that we can run. One uh, set of protocols that we can run uh, within the autonomous system, which are referred to as IGP protocols. So within the autonomous system, we can run protocols such as RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, ISIS. Uh, these protocols are specifically designed to work within the autonomous system. But when we talk about the protocols uh, that we can run in between the autonomous system, such as like, this is let's say one autonomous system number one, this is autonomous system number two. So when we want to run any protocol to exchange the route information, from one autonomous system to the autonomous system. There we use, uh, typically we only have one option nowadays, that is BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. So BGP is the only exterior gateway protocol that you will see nowadays. Earlier days, like we had other options as well, such as we has like EGP was a protocol in itself as well. Before that, we had the protocol called GGP, Gateway to Gateway Protocol, uh, Exterior Gateway Protocol. These protocols are nowadays not used that much. In fact, like these are more like obsolete. So the only protocol that we get when it comes to like exterior gateway routing is border gateway protocol or BGP. So within the autonomous system, like intra AS routing, IGP protocols, inter AS routing, BGP, we are typically going to use. Again, uh, the last point that we discussed in the last class was that uh, it's not like we cannot use IGP as EGP, and it's not like we cannot use EGPs as IGP. It's just the protocol. It's just a matter of configuration. This is one autonomous system. This is another autonomous system. We can definitely run any IGP protocol here, and we can definitely run a BGP protocol inside the autonomous system. But remember that IGP protocols are not designed to work as EGP, and EGP protocols are not designed to work as IGP. So uh, even though you can use it, you can use IGP as exterior gateway protocols. You can use EGPs as interior gateway protocol, but you might face a few challenges. Uh, so you should, as long as possible, like uh, as far as possible, like you, you should you should avoid using IGP as EGP or EGP as IGP protocols. So to perform the routing between the autonomous system, typically go for EGP protocol, and to perform the routing within the autonomous system, go for any IGP protocol. You might need to perform the redistribution from IGP to EGP, EGP to IB, IGP, IGP to EGP, EGP to IGP, so that the routes can be exchanged from one point to other point. Now, uh, these protocols that we have, all these protocols, they run on different, different algorithms. So one algorithm that we have on which these protocols run is called distance vector algorithm. Distance vector algorithm is basically used by the distance vector routing protocols. Distance vector routing protocols such as RIP and IGRP. So RIP version 1 and RIP version 2. Uh, these are two protocols. Uh, these are two protocols that we have, like RIP, routing information protocol version 1, version 2 and interior gateway routing protocol, IGRP. These two protocols are categorized as the distance vector routing protocol. Uh, they use distance vector algorithm to decide their best path to reach to a particular destination. So best path selection in the distance vector routing protocol is done based on a distance vector algorithm. So all the protocols that are categorized as the distance vector routing protocol, such as RIP and IGRP, they, are going, they will decide their best path based on distance vector algorithm. So distance vector algorithm is used by the distance vector protocol, such as RIP, to advertise the route to the next neighboring device. And these distance vector routing protocols are called distance vector routing protocol because they decide their best path based on two parameter, distance and vector. Means like in, which, in whichever vector, vector basically means direction. In whichever direction, in whichever direction, distance is less, that path is going to be preferred as the best path. That path will be elected as the best path. So distance vector protocols, distance vector protocols are those protocols that decide their best path to reach to a destination based on parameters, distance. So distance basically like uh, if, if I want to reach to this certain destination, if I want to reach to this particular destination, how far that destination actually is. If I, if I go via this path, if I go via this path or if I go via this path, uh, how long it's going to take, like at what, at what distance this destination is from this path, from this path or from this path. That is basically 
calculated and whichever path has a lowest distance to reach to the destination, that path is going to be selected as the best path. So distance vector routing protocol use distance as a, as a best path selection criteria, which is what we also refer to as metric. So distance vector routing protocol use distance as the metric and they measure the distance. They measure the distance in terms of hop count. Like how far a destination is from the router, how far the destination is from this router, because this router has to decide if I have multiple path, which path is going to be the best path. So this router is going to take a look at this path. <coughs> this router is going to find out the best path to reach to the certain destination based on hop count. So distance is measured in distance vector protocols. Distance is measured in terms of hop count. So if I go via this path, the total number of hops that I have to cross, total number of routers that I have to cross is like four. If I go via this path, total number of routers that I have to cross is two. If I go via this path, the total number of uh, uh, hops, the total number of routers that I have to cross is, let's say, for example, five. So I, this router now knows if it follows this path, there are four networks that it has to cross. There are two networks that it has to cross. There are five networks that it has to cross. So it is going to choose the path with the least number of hops or lowest number of hop counts from whichever path there is. That path will be selected as the best path. So distance vector algorithm, distance vector algorithm is used by the distance vector routing protocol such as RIP and these decide their best path based on the distance and direction. So in whichever vector, vector basically means direction, in whichever direction to reach to a network, in whichever direction distance is less, that path is going to be selected as the best path uh, as per this distance vector algorithm. So uh, distance is measured in terms of hop count and vector basically means direction. Direction is basically like the exit interface. If I go out of this interface, I have to cross like total three hop. If I go via this interface, I have to cross like five hop. If I go via this interface, I have to cross, let's say, for example, two hop. So out of whichever interface or which we say in whichever direction, there is least number of hops to cross, that path is going to be selected as the best path. So whichever next hop, like I, I have to reach to a certain destination. And if I go via this next, if I go via this, uh, 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 if I go, if I exit via this interface or if I go via this direction, if I go in this direction, I have to cross least amount of hops. I have to change the least number of networks. So I'm going to select this path as the best path. So the packet will be sent from this router to the next router, then from here to the next router, from here to the next router or towards the destination. So distance vector, distance vector routing protocol, they work based on the distance and vector. Uh, always remember, it's not the responsibility of the router to send the packet towards the desk to, uh, all the way to the destination. It's not the responsibility of the router to send the packet all the way to the destination. The only responsibility of the router is that when the packet arrives onto a certain interface, receive the packet and uh, place that packet out of a particular exit interface. Once the packet gets placed from one interface to other interface, now this, this router's responsibility is done. Like now this doesn't care. Now this router does not care if the packet gets delivered. If, if the packet does not get delivered, packet gets lost, packet uh, gets dropped by the any router, it doesn't matter. So router's responsibility is not to, not to send the packet all the way to the destination. Router's responsibility is to actually send the packet towards the next hop. Next hop basically means next stop. So if I have to go to this destination, and uh, I know that this is my best path. So I am going to send the packet towards that particular next stop. So router is going to forward the packet towards the next stop. Next stop basically means next stop, which is let's say, for example, in this case, router two. Once the packet arrives at router two, now it's router two's responsibility to place the packet on a certain exit interface towards the next next stop, then towards the next next stop and towards the, let's say, for example, destination. So Routers, they are not responsible to route the packet all the way to the destination. They are just responsible to they are just responsible to place the packet on the appropriate exit interface so that it can be sent towards the next stop. Once the packet is received at the next stop, then this is this router's responsibility to route the packet towards the destination. When the packet receives at this next stop, then this is this router's responsibility to route the packet towards the destination. And then the routing happens on hop by hop basis. So on hop by hop basis, when the routing happens, at the end, the packet will be received by the destination. So uh, next hop, next stop is the next stop. Like if I have to reach to a certain destination, what is going to be my next stop? Next hop, uh, next hop represents actually that. 
So in whichever direction, in whichever direction, I have less distance. In whichever direction, I have the less distance that is going to be referred, that is going to be preferred as like uh, uh, the best path. So that is that is like a distance vector algorithm. So after a router receives the routes, it is stores it in the local routing database. Then it runs the algorithm such as Bellman Ford or, or Ford plus Kern algorithm. These are distance vector algorithms like Bellman Ford algorithm used by the RIP routing protocol or the Ford plus Kern algorithm to determine the best path and install it in the routing table. And the best path is going to also be advertised to the neighboring router. So once the router decides like, okay, this is the best path to reach the destination, the router is also going to advertise that best path to the router number two. Router 2 is going to receive that best path information. Uh, then the router is going to install that best path in its own routing table. And then it is going to advertise to router number 3. Then router 3 is going to install that route in the routing table. Then router number 3 is going to uh, route the packet toward, uh, it is going to advertise that route towards the next particular router. So after the router receives the route, it, says, it stores it in the routing table. Then it runs the algorithms, distance vector algorithms, such as Bellman fold algorithm, fold plus Kern algorithm. To determine the best path and install that best path in the routing table. Also, the best path is advertised to the neighboring device. Now, the problem with the distance vector routing protocol is that distance vector routing protocol does not have a complete map of the whole network. Instead, it, its database just reflects that a neighboring router knows how to reach to a destination. Uh, this is basically what we refer to as uh, routing on rumors. Uh, distance vector routing protocols, they perform this thing called routing on rumors. So this is a router. Router has this particular destination. Router has advertised that destination information to router two. Router two has advertised that information to router three. Router three has advertised it to router four. Router four has advertised it to router five. Now router five cannot actually see that the destination A is actually connected at router number one. All it sees that if I have to go to destination A, I need to go to router number four. So th this is the only thing that the router five sees. Router five. Router 5 knows that it can reach to the destination A. Why? Because Router 4 has said so. Router 4 has said, Router 4 has, give, has given me a route saying that I can take you towards the destination A. And I'm going to blindly trust that information. I'm not going to uh, cross check or very later that, okay, if this can actually reach to the destination or not, I, I, it, it doesn't matter. If Router 4 says that it can reach to the destination, okay, Router 4 can reach to the destination. So if I need to send any traffic to the destination A, I will send it towards the route number four. So since neighbor has said, neighbor said that I have a route to reach to the destination, neighbor said that I can take you towards this destination, I am going to believe that information without any verification. So router five routing table, router five uh, is having a routing table and router five's router ta routing table um, or routing database, if I say, that uh, reflects that a neighbor at the neighbor router knows how to reach to the destination. So neighbor is saying that if you want to go to the destination A, there are total like uh, three hops from my point. I can take you to the destination and to go to the destination, there are three hops from my point. And so once you receive that information that the neighbor is saying that it can take you towards the destination A and the hop count is going to be three, you are going to blindly trust that information. There is no way that you can validate it. Uh, you are going to trust the information that you have receiving from the router number four, which is your neighbor, and you are going to store that route in the routing table. So router five's routing database or router five's routing table, uh, they, like this router five does not like this router five does not have the entire topological map of the network. It just knows to reach to that it can reach to a destination just because its neighboring router has said so. So distance vector protocol does not have a complete map of the whole network. Instead, its database reflects that neighbor router knows how to reach to a destination and how far the neighbor router is from the destination network. So neighbor can reach to this destination and neighbor is three hops away. That information is given to me. I am going to blindly trust that particular information. So the sensor routing protocol, they do not maintain a complete topological map of the entire network. For example, in this topology, there is a network 192.168.1.0 slash 24. Router 7 is going to advertise that network to router number 2. It is going to advertise that network to router number 1. It is going to advertise that network to router number 6. It will say that if you want to go to this destination, uh, the, 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 you can reach to that destination uh, with the hop count value of 1. 
this is also going to say like you can reach it you can go there with the hop count value of one this router receives it when this router is going to advertise that route information to the neighbor router it will advertise that you can reach to that destination with the hop count value of 2 when this router receives this information from the router number 2 and router number 7 it will now compare which of these two paths is the best one it will compare that if i had to go to this destination and to go to this destination if i follow router number 2 next hop then there are total two hops that i have to cross but if i follow this uh, router number 7 next hop there's only one hop i need to cross so this path based on the least number of hops to cross will become the best path and this path information will be advertised to the neighbor router so neighbor router number 3 will now know that to go to the destination 192.168.1 like my next hop is actually router number 1 and total number of hops that i had to cross is actually 2 from this path because like now when you receive the information from here the hop count will be 2 when you receive the information from here the hop count is going to be 3 when you receive the information from here the hop count is going to be 4 so now this router 3 is again going to compare that if i go via router 1 the total number of hops are 2 and if i go via router number 4 the total number of hops are 4 so in between 2 and 4 least number of hops are from router number 1 so that is going to be the best path so out of this entire topology what router 3 is going to see is only this one out of this entire topology the only thing that the router 3 is the router 3 sees is that if it has to go to the destination 192.168.1 its next hop is router 1 and the metric is metric is total 2 it actually is not able to see this router 3 is not able to see uh, the other like uh, router information such as router 2 router 4 router 5 router 6, it, it is not aware that 192.168.1 is actually at router number 7 it is blindly trusting the information that it is receiving from router number 1 there is no way that it can validate that information in any way so it is just again it is blindly trusting the information from the neighbor router and it is performing the routing based on that uh, received information which is what we refer to as routing on gamers so if the neighbor is saying that i can take you to the destination with the hop count value of two yeah okay i accept so if the neighbor says that i can take you to the destination with hop count value of four okay i accept so since routing is being done based on the information given by the neighbor the, uh, without even validating anything this is uh, uh, this is what we refer to as routing on reverse and since again since you do not have the entire topological map of the network you are just performing routing on rumors uh, just because router one said that it can take you to the destination you sent all the packet to router one uh, to router one the information was received from router number seven so router one sent all the packet to router number seven now there could come uh, a possibility with the router seven uh, let's say for example did not send the traffic to here but the router seven uh, sent the traffic to router number two router two has sent that traffic to particular router number one basically there could come a situation based on because of this routing on numbers there could come a situation because of which routing loops can be formed because you are trusting the information that you are receiving from the neighbor blindly you are performing this routing on numbers because of that there are very high possibilities in distance vector routing protocol that a routing loop might occur routing loops might occur uh, in case of like uh, distance vector routing protocols because you are you are trusting the information that you have received from the neighbor blindly uh, so you are not you are not even validating the information that you have received from the neighbor you do not have the entire topological map of the network you are just uh, completely dependent on the information given by the neighbor router whatever neighbor router says that is correct if neighbor router says that to go to this destination uh, i can take you there you are going to send all the packet there if neighbor is going to send all the packet to here there, there could be a chance where this router 7 can send the packet to router 2 router 2 can send the packet to router 1 and the packet might get stuck in the loop just because you did not validate uh, if the neighbor is saying that i can take you to the destination can neighbor actually take you to the destination or not just because you have not done any sort of verification regarding the same so because of the routing on rumors routing loops might occur in the distance vector routing protocols pinhole congestion uh, like for example let's say let's say this is a serial cable let's say this is a serial cable let's say this is a serial cable now or let me just connect one in between that will be sufficient so let's say for example 
let's say this is the topology let's say that this is the topology now router number 2 has this path to reach to this destination and router 2 also has this path to reach to the destination now this time the hop count from the upper path is also 2 and the hop count from the lower path is also 2 that means you can take two hops to reach to the destination and you can take two hops to reach to the destination so now since the router one has found that uh, uh, there are two equal cost path to reach to the destination i can perform multi pathing as well i can perform like ecmp ecmp means equal cost multi path equal cost multi path basically means that i am going to since i have like two equal cost path to reach to the destination equal metric path to reach to the destination i am going to perform this thing called load balancing i am going to load balance the traffic in between these two link so now let's say you have received like 100 number of packets 100 number of packets you have received 50 packets went from this path 50 packets went from this path traffic is being shared equally traffic is being shared equally among the like in between these two paths why because these two paths have equal cost to reach to the destination the problem is this is serial link and serial link has a way too slow speed as compared to fast ethernet or let's say for example gigabit ethernet links but the the, the, the problem that router one has only one metric and that metric is hop count so as long as the hop counts are same it will always perform the equal cost load balancing no matter what the bandwidth no matter what the speed actually is so if you if you have received like 100 packets 1000 packets 10000 packet 1 lakh packet 10 lakh packet does not matter all those packets are going to be equally divided in between these two links so half of the packets will go from here and half of the packets will go from here the problem is all the messages that got sent from the upper path all the messages that got sent from the upper path they will be received by router 7 very quickly and all the messages that we are sending on this slow speed link will be received with some delay like they will not because this is a slow speed link it will take some time for these packets to get routed from one uh, network to other network the problem is this router until it has received all the messages uh, those messages cannot be forwarded towards the destination let's say for example there was a very big data and that data got segmented and once it got segmented fragmented then the data was sent from this path and from this path so until you have received all the segments and fragments you cannot send the traffic towards the neighboring device now you have received those 50 packets from the upper path but now you are just waiting for the 50 packets to be received from the lower path and then you can you know assemble all the data and send it towards the destination meanwhile temporarily you are going to store the data in the buffer memory until like those 50 packets that you have received those are those packets are going to be received in the buffer memory and now i am just waiting for the rest of the 50 packets to receive and once i receive the, the rest of the 50 packets i'm going to do the sequencing and all those things and then i'm going to forward the packet towards the destination since the load balancing is being done on two unequal speed path the faster path will send the traffic very quickly as compared to this slower speed path but the traffic will not be received by the destination until the router has received all the messages and let's say again 50 packets come again same process again 50 packets come again same process again like 100 packets come like same process same process will keep happening again and again like all the messages that we have received from the upper path they are just uh, put in the buffer memory and the buffer, because of that the buffer memory is getting like full and rest of the packets are getting dropped so because of this uh, uh, load balancing that you started doing because of this load balancing that you started doing over this unequal speed path you have a phase the condition and that condition is what we refer to as spin hole condition you can read about it if you want we don't need to discuss any distance vector routing protocol this was just for your knowledge so spin hole condition typically happens Con condition is basically like a uh, uh condition can result in packet drops condition is basically like the uh, device is facing some some heavy traffic and it is not able to forward the traffic at the same rate at which it is receiving the traffic so when we perform the load balancing over those unequal speed path due to any reason we might face a condition and that condition is what we are going to refer to as spin hole condition other challenges such as there is a single metric value hop count so only hop count will matter even though this is a slow speed path it doesn't matter It, it the traffic will always get forwarded from this path because the number of hops is very less so other challenges are there as well the biggest challenge was routing on remote routing loop in whole condition uh, other challenges such as for example 
uh, single metric. There is a single metric based on which the best path will be decided, which is hop count. So it is not going to consider the bandwidth. It is not going to consider the speed or any other thing. Uh, summarization and a lot of lot of other challenges are there as well in the distance vector routing protocol. Uh, they do not have the entire topological map of the network, so uh, routing loops can be formed very easily and all. So routing on rumors is done. So there are there are like you know different different challenges that you might face in the distance vector routing protocol. That is why these distance vector routing protocols are not very popular. Uh, these protocols are not very popular to be used in the production environment. Like you will hardly see a protocol such as RIP or IGRP in your production environment. IGRP is officially like obsolete. RIP version 2, you can still see in some places where the RIP version 2 is the only protocol supported. But other than that, you will very hardly see the RIP version 2 protocol. If you have a device that only supports RIP version 2, then you have no other option. But other than that, like you will very hardly see any protocol such as RIP version 2 in your production environment. Uh, some banking sectors, they still use uh, the RIP, RIP version 2 protocol because the, the router that they have, uh, it is only supportive of the RIP routing protocol. And they uh, either never got the chance to change that router or they just did not change the router anyway. So like uh, distance vector routing protocols, which use the distance vector algorithm, they like you are going to very, 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 like you are, you are more, like you are not likely to see these protocols in your production environment. Uh, yes, Ashish, let me know. So I was saying that, you know, in the IGRP case or here, the scenario, uh, when yeah. we have the equal cost, okay, so, uh -huh. you know, uh, the routing protocol will take place for the uh, load balancing packet transfer. Yes, yes. So what logic behind the packet transfer? Is there any, you know, uh, any uh, software coding that, you know, when we compare the everything is same, then you start uh, transferring the packet 50-50%. Is, is there any logic uh, or any mechanism? There are two mechanisms actually. There are two mechanisms that is implemented on the devices typically to perform this load balancing thing. One mechanism says like this is again in the coding. This is again in the coding of the operating system that we have on the devices. Okay. So that load balancing thing since we are talking about that, although it will come later on in the chapter. But uh, there are two mechanisms by which these device can perform the load balancing. One is called like per packet load balancing and one is called per destination load balancing. So these again, these two techniques are uh, implemented on these uh, uh, these devices at the software level. That means like whenever a router detects that there are multiple paths to reach to a destination and those paths have equal metric, no matter if it is RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, whatever protocol you are using, it can choose to load balance the packets either based on per packet or uh, per destination load balancing. Means like if I have received like 100 packet, one packet will go from here, one packet will go from here, then set third, then fourth, then fifth, then sixth. In short, 50 packets will go from here, 50 packets will go from here. It is what we are going to refer per packet load balancing. In some situations, this per packet load balancing is not very beneficial. So uh, you might want to send the entire traffic from one path, entire traffic from one path uh, for a certain destination. So uh, what, what I can do, I can choose the word, uh, load balancing called per destination load balancing, where the packet, when it arrives on router number one, let's say you have received 100 packets. Uh, so router is going to take a look at the destination IP address. And if the destination IP address is same for those 100 packets, they will always follow the same path. And if the packet has to go to a different destination, then the packet might follow this path. So load balancing will still take place, but it will not be on per packet basis. It will be more like per destination. So for one particular destination, one path is more like fixed. And for the other destination, the other path is going to be fixed. So the load balancing will still, in that case, take place. So yes, there are two techniques per packet, per destination. Default one is per destination. Default one is per destination. And that is because of this uh, Ceph. Cisco Express forwarding that is running by default on these Cisco devices. Uh, so Ceph uh, actually is responsible uh, to perform the load balancing. Ceph is basically responsible to route the packet from one interface to the other interface, not your routing table. So uh, Ceph technology that we have, it is it is basically responsible to uh, decide like how the load balancing will take place. And the default load balancing in case of Ceph is per destination. That means for a destination, the packet will always follow one particular path. And if we have like packet for multiple destinations, those packets will be load balanced on multiple path. Since the distance vector routing protocol, they do not maintain the entire topological map of the network. This is also an advantage. This is also an advantage. Uh, this is this is a this is a problem, of course, because you don't have the idea of the entire topology. So you are just blindly trusting the information that is received by the neighbor, that is that is given to you by the neighbor, 
uh, which is what we refer to as routing on reverse and it can cause the routing loop. So that is a problem. But it is also a it also adds a little advantage in our routing network. Since, since on this router, we are not having the entire topological database, the amount of resources required, the amount of resources that we require to run a distance vector routing protocol is very less. Like we do not require a very high CPU, very high memory. We do not require uh, a lot of uh, resources to run those distance vector routing protocol. The advantage of the distance vector protocol is that they require very less CPU, memory, and they can run on low-end router, but the routing will be dependent on the neighboring router, which of course can cause the loops and all, but uh, it doesn't require high CPU and memory to run. So it can run on the low-end routers. Uh, that is one of the advantages. So let's say, for example, in one of the branch that you have, uh, that branch is having a very old uh, router that might have been that might have gone like end of sale, end of support, maybe uh, uh, like let let's say for example, eighteen forty one router. Uh, but that branch actually that branch router that branch uh, uh, did not have like uh, a lot of users, like only 100, 200 users were there. Uh, those those can be handled very well by these small scale router. So in, the, in in that situation, in that case, like you do not need to, you, you have already implemented the rip routing protocol. So you do not need to actually alter, you do not need to change the protocol onto that branch. It will just keep running on those low-end routers perfectly. So there is also one, this, there is also this advantage. Since you do not know the entire topology, you don't need to maintain the entire topological database in some memory. So you will not require that much memory or CPU resources. A distance vector routing protocol does not support any other metric than the hop count. One of the most common distance vector protocol that we use is RIP version 2, RIP version 2. Earlier, this was in your content, but nowadays we don't study about RIP version 2. More or less, it's, it's, it, it, it is in most of the network and it will be in uh, most of the network. Will, it, it will go obsolete sooner or later. So RIP routing protocol, you will again very hardly see in any of your production environment. So this is how the distance vector routing protocol run. The distance vector routing protocols actually they run uh, based on the distance vector algorithm. Doubts any? If you have, let me know. Any question? Anyone? Let me know. Write them now. Distance vector routing protocol that we have, since they do not maintain the entire topological uh, map of the network, they are prone to routing loops, routing on reverse, and some other problems. So they can, they created these protocols called link state routing protocols. Link state routing protocols such as OSPF and ISIS, they run on link state algorithm. Link state algorithm says that I am going to advertise the uh, network information based on the state of the link. So if the link comes up, I am going to send the update. If the link goes down, then I am going to send the update. So link state routing protocol, they advertise their best route information based on the link state and the link metric to all the other routers. Like for example, this. This is uh, the router. It is connected. Sorry, this is the router. This is connected to 192.168.1 network. I am going to, since this link has come up, I am going to advertise this information to the neighboring router. I am going to advertise that I am connected. I am connected to a network. And to uh, use this network, the metric, the cost is going to be, let's say, for example, 10. The cost is going to be, let's say, for example, 100, whatever. So link state routing protocol advertise the best route information based on the link state and link metric. So like if the link comes up, it will send the update. If the link goes down, it will send the update, right? Uh, to all the other uh, routers. So protocols such as OSPF, protocols such as ISIS, they come under this category. Protocols like we have OSPF, we have protocols such as ISIS, and these protocols like OSPF and ISIS, they come under this particular category. Now, both of these protocols that we have here, like OSPF protocol or the ISIS protocol, like OSPF, uh, ISIS protocol, both the protocols, they advertise their information in the format of LSA, link state advertisement. So OSPF and also like uh, uh, ISIS protocol, they do their advertisements in the format of LSA. In case of ISIS, we call them LSP, link state path. In OSPF, we call them LSAs. In the ISIS, we call them LSP. But again, OSPF and ISS, both are the link state routing protocol, both work on the link state algorithm, both decide their best path based on some parameters such as cost, which is dependent on the link bandwidth, depended upon bandwidth. Uh, so both decide the, in the ISS protocol, there are some other metric components as well, other metric parameters as well, but uh, cost is going to remain there as well. So OSPF advertisements are referred to as like LSA, link state advertisements. 
and ISIS advertisements are called LSP, uh, link state path. Routers receive the LSA or LSP, they store it in its database and then advertise the information as it is to the neighboring router. Means when this router 4 advertises this information to the router number 2 and router 3, router 3 is going to store that information in its own database and then it is going to advertise it to router 4. It is not going to do any changes in that. Router 2, once it receives that information, it is going to store it in its own database and then it will advertise it to the neighbor router as it is. Without doing any changes, it will advertise the information to the neighbor router. The information is flooded till the end of the network. Similar to that, this router 2 is going to advertise its own information. Similar to that, router 1 is going to advertise its own information. Eventually, when every router advertises its own information everywhere, when the, all the information is flooded in the network, everyone will have the database. Everyone will have the database. This database is what we refer to as link state database. Over this database, this link state protocols, they are going to run the algorithms such as SPF algorithm, shortest path first algorithm. They will calculate the best path and they will install that best path in the routing table. So unlike distance vector routing protocol, where the best path information is directly given to you from the neighbor router, like router one calculates the best path to reach to the destination and it advertises the best path directly to the neighbor router. Then router two receives that best path information, stores it in its own routing table and then advertise that to the neighboring router. So just like, just like the uh, distance vector routing protocol in the distance vector routing protocol, best route information gets advertised from one point to the point. In case of link state routing protocol, that's not the case. In case of link state routing protocol, routers, they advertise their link state database to the neighboring router. And once every router has the database, it will run the SPF algorithm over the database. They will calculate the best path and they will install the best path in the routing table. So they are not dependent for the best path information in the, on the neighbor router. Routers, they need the database. Over this database, they will execute the SPF algorithm. They will calculate the best path and they will install the best path to the neighboring router. And since they have the complete network of the, uh, they, since they, due to having the complete map of the network, they require more CPU and memory than the distance vector protocol, but they are less prone to routing loops and make better path decision. It doesn't say they are completely uh, loop free. We consider uh, these protocols, uh, link state routing protocols as loop free protocol, but it's not like they are 100% loop free. They are like less prone to routing loops as compared to the distance vector protocol just because they have the uh, entire idea of the network. The router 3 can see that, okay, 192.168.1 is not connected on router 2, not connected on router 1, but it is connected on router number 4. Router 3 has a, a visibility. Router 3 has the idea of the entire network. So uh, just because it has received the link state database, with the help of the link state database, it will get the idea of the entire network and then uh, it will decide the best path accordingly, which will be like less prone to the root as compared to the distance vector routing protocol. But remember that the link state routing protocol will require more CPU resources and memory uh, to run uh, its like algorithm to run to store the database, to keep the topological information and all. It will require much more resources as compared to the distance vector. So now, if you, if you take a look at this timeline, if you take a look at this like uh, routing protocol timeline, uh, you will find out that uh, approximately in 1980s, you will see this protocol such as uh, uh, report than one. Even like if I have, let me see. I had actually one better uh, chart where they mentioned uh, the routing protocol timeline actually. It's not visible properly. Uh, that will be so this like for example here for example uh, if you talk about like evolution of the dynamic routing protocol so egp was the first protocol that was introduced in the network approximately in 1982 then came igrp interior gateway routing protocol it was uh, created by sysfordian in 1985 then we had like ripper one in 1988 so these were like distance vector, like uh, these were like distance vector protocols that were earlier available uh, in 1980s. So 1985, 1988, they had these protocols such as IGRP and Ripperson one, uh, which were very widely being used as the distance vector protocols. And 
and we also had the egp protocol egp was more like the first protocol that we used to have then we had like igrp then we had like repoison these are also called classful routing protocol classful routing protocol what is this classful routing classful routing basically means that these protocols they do not support any summary uh, submitting summarization uh, like manual summarization those things are not supported means if i have configured a class a network the subnet mask must always be class slash 8 if i have configured a class b network uh, subnet mask will always be slash 16 and if i have configured a class c network then the subnet mask will always be slash 24 it means it it is obvious it is obvious that if igrp protocol is advertising 10th network it it will be slash 8 it's obvious it's obvious that if person 1 is advertising 192.168.10 network information it's obvious that it will be 24 that is why these classful routing protocols they do not even advertise the subnet mask in the update message because it's obvious it's obvious that if it is class a network it will be slash 8 if it is class b network it will be slash 16 and if it is class c network it is slash 24 that is why we say classful routing protocols are those protocols that do not advertise classful routing protocols are those protocols that do not advertise the uh, subnet mask information to the neighbor router why they don't advertise the subnet mask information to the neighbor router because it's obvious it's obvious that if it is class a network it will be slash 8 if it is a class b network that you are advertising it is slash 16 and if it is a class c network it will be slash 24 and since i am not even advertising the subnet mask to the neighbor router things such as subnetting supernetting is not even supported vlsm these things are not even supported so classful routing protocols like ig uh, igrp recursion one egp these are classified as the classful routing protocols in 90s in 1990 there came a protocol called isis intermediate system to intermediate system the term intermediate system refers to router in terms of osi model uh, is means intermediate system and es es means end system end systems were pc and is basically means like intermediate systems which is just the router so effectively what we are saying router to router protocol so a protocol that that runs between router to router to advertise the route information so it is an osi terminology is es so whenever any day you study isis protocol you will learn about these things so isis protocol got developed in 1990s and it was a a uh, link state routing protocol uh, that can be used in the production environment mostly service providers they started implementing these the isis protocol in the network it was a link state routing protocol uh, used to run the link state algorithm sort of path first algorithm uh, it 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 was less prone to loop uh, all the all the advantages were there just one big disadvantage that uh, uh, it required like more cpu and resources to maintain its database to uh, run the algorithms and all so now people have then again in 1991 there came a protocol called ospf version 2 ospf version 1 never came into existence so the uh, the protocol that uh, that launched that was launched for the uh, again as an alternative for the isis protocol as a link state routing protocol it was like ospf ospf open shortest path first version 2 it is ospf for ipv4 ospf version 1 never got like uh, implemented on the devices so you will not see ospf version 1 in the network ha like rip version 1 you will still see they have not still said that it is officially obsolete so you might still see like rip version 1 in the operating systems nowadays as well uh, they have not said officially that it's going to obsolete so uh, not sure in the 15.9 or so but in 15.67 it was still available so you might need to check the official documentation regarding the same but still like it's not like it is it has gone completely obsolete so uh, it still it still is available in the network so yes it, it you will still see uh, this protocol represent to in 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 the operating systems so now people have two choices uh, like uh, either they can use the distance vector protocol or they can use the link state protocols they had like two choices till 1991 they had two choices either they can go for distance vector protocols or they can use these link state protocol if you go for distance vector routing protocol uh they were very suitable for uh like uh, low low end routers like where the resources were not that much and the ospf files as protocol were suitable for the networks where we have routers with good cpu resources and all now cisco already had this igrp what they did 
when this link state routing protocols were introduced in 1990 1991 isis or spf what they did actually what cisco did actually in 1992 they took their igrp protocol they took this distance vector routing protocol and they added a few functionalities of the link state routing protocol they they added a few functionality of this link state routing protocol ospf and isis and they created a newer version of igrp but instead of saying that it's igrp version 2 they started saying it eigrp or enhanced igrp it could have been like more of a marketing strategy like uh, enhanced igrp it's not igrp version 2 it's like enhanced igrp so in 1992 they launched this protocol eigrp and it was proprietary like you can run this protocol only on cisco devices and it has like quite a lot of benefits a lot of benefits like uh, uh, it has the properties of both distance vector and the link state more properties of the distance vector less properties of the link state that's why we still call it we call igrp as enhanced distance vector routing protocol we don't call it a link state routing protocol it is more of a enhanced distance vector routing protocol or advanced distance vector routing protocol but still it is distance vector routing protocol it has only a few properties of the link state routing protocol such as such as the link state routing protocol they used to form the neighborship ospf forms the neighborship adjacency here the same concept was there uh, such as for example the ospf and iss protocol they do not send the periodic updates just like the reposition does uh, reposition one does or the igrp does the igrp and reposition one they used to advertise their information in every 30 seconds igrp if i believe it was in 90 seconds I, i'm not sure but i believe it was in 90 seconds so periodic updates were there in case of reposition one and igrp so in ospf and isis the updates about the subnets updates about the routes only were sent when there is a change in the network so they borrowed that property as well that okay uh, we are also not going to send the periodic updates we are going to send the update whenever the changes to the network actually happen so they actually borrowed a few properties we'll talk about that in IG, eigrp they borrowed a few properties they added a few more properties such as unequal cost load balancing uh, such as they added this uh, a concept of successor feasible successor they added like a few more concepts they enhanced this igrp and launched it with the name of eigrp and it became like very popular protocol to be used in a production environment if you have a cisco device so in 1992 they launched this eigrp proprietary then in 1994 uh, rip since it was a proprietary protocol since this eigrp was a proprietary protocol So, uh, it had the link state routing protocol properties so in 1994 they launched this reposition 2 and the reposition 2 uh, came with a few advantages over the reposition 1 such as for example first of all it was classless that means it can support subnetting supernetting flsm vlsm all those things it can actually support one of the biggest advantage of using reposition 2 was like this it was classless that it used to support subnetting flsm vlsm and all those things authentication it 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 now supports authentication as well like two routers first must get authenticated to each other and then they will be able to exchange the outs which was not there in the reposition there are some differences in reposition one and version two then in 1995 there came a protocol called border gateway protocol so bgp actually came quite late because igp was working very well uh, at that time so approximately from 1982 to 1995 the only protocol that we are using for exterior gateway routing was edp then came bgp in the market in 1995 and from 99 since 1995 we have not created any new protocol 1995 was the last time when 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 like this it uh, you know network they have seen a new protocol such as bgp but after that they have not seen a new protocol so again in that when i where uh, parallelly they were also working on things such as ipv6 when ipv6 got very uh, common in the network when ipv6 was launched i believe it was in 1996 and somehow somewhere so uh, in approximately like in thing in, in in 1996 they launched the ipv6 so in 1997 they uh, they launched this rip ng rip for next generation which is just to rip for ipv6 then uh, next generation this word next generation uh, 
there was a movie at that time like i think star trek next generation um, if i'm not wrong star trek next generation based on that uh, keyword next generation they used it here repenji so repenji they launched in 1997 uh, which is a rip for ipv6 then they launched a wspf version 3 and mp vgp multi protocol vgp uh, which is uh, again wspf for ipv6 vgp for ipv6 not only for ipv6 but it supports multiple address families then they launched in 2000 isis version 6 So this was the last time when a new protocol got introduced in the market, and since then we actually have not introduced any new protocol. When it comes to like proper routing in the enterprise network, we have these options nowadays. Uh, like uh, we can run protocols like BGP, we can run EIGRP, we can run RIP, we can run OSPF and all. So uh, these were just IPv6 uh, capabilities were added in all these protocols. So the point was some people were running up to this point. Some people were running. rip some people were running ospf or isis uh, both has their own advantages and disadvantages link state routing protocol and distance vector routing protocol they had their advantages and disadvantages so cisco came up with the idea of creating a protocol that has both the properties properties of distance vector and link state and they called it eigrp enhanced integer gateway routing protocol that used to run on enhanced distance vector algorithm named dual Dual is the name of the algorithm that runs on the EIGRP, a diffusing update algorithm. The name Dual stands for diffusing update algorithm, and it is the algorithm run by protocols such as EIGRP, uh, which is categorized as enhanced distance vector routing protocol. These are the advantages of using EIGRP. It offers rapid convergence time for changes in the network topology. it sends update only when there is a change in the network it does not change it, it even not it is not even going to send the full routing updates in the periodic fashion just like the distance vector routing protocol do distance vector routing protocol they advertise the entire routing table in let's say for example 30 seconds in case of rip routing protocol in distance vector routing protocol first the uh, first uh, like in the distance vector routing protocol whatever information i have i'm going to give that information to you but in case of these enhanced distance vector routing protocol first the two devices will form some sort of neighborship first these devices will form some sort of neighborship once they form the neighborship just like the link state routing protocol does then they are going to exchange the route information to each other just like not only relying on the uh, the bandwidth or not only relying on uh, like hop count the distance this these enhanced distance vector routing protocols such as eigrp uses bandwidth delay reliability load and mtu uh, instead of hop count for best path decision which path is the best path among these three it will be decided based on like bandwidth delay reliability load and mtu it can perform like equal cost and unequal cost load balancing as well it it can have like successor feasible successor like best path backup path path it has a lot of advantages as compared to the distance vector protocol and that is why it became like very popular choice of routing protocol to be used in an enterprise network if you have cisco devices and everything went everything went well up to 2013 from 1992 to 2013 this protocol remained as the proprietary protocol for cisco in 2013 cisco decides to uh, release this protocol as an open standard protocol and they uh, they they released an rfc that you can refer they released this rfc cisco's enhanced igrp uh, this one so they 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 officially in 2013 they opened this uh, the eigrp protocol for public so this was like uh, this is what we refer to as a draft savage rfc so based on the based on the name of the engineer who has published this document so doc like savage was the name so graft savage rfc we used to call this right so this is like everything that you need to know from eigrp point of view this is like official documentation for the eigrp uh, that cisco has published in a format of rfc document on the internet so now anyone can actually implement it anyone can actually implement it this protocol Uh, in their operating system in their uh, like for example juniper operating system huawei operating system but actually no one has done that yet at least so uh, since 2013 this eigrp protocol is more like a cisco only protocol 
It is open standard, but Cisco is the only vendor that is still using this protocol in their devices. So EIGRP, Enhanced IGRP, is again a protocol that has the, both the properties of distance vector and link state. It has more properties of the distance vector, less properties of the link state. That's why we don't call it enhanced the link state. We call it enhanced distance vector routing protocol. Sometimes we will also call this a hybrid protocol. Enhanced distance vector, advanced distance vector, or hybrid protocol, people call this. Any doubt so far, let me know. Now, the last algorithm that we see is on the last algorithm that we see is on exterior gateway protocol such as BGP, which is referred to as path vector algorithm. Path vector algorithm is quite similar to as distance vector algorithm. Uh, with, with, with a slight difference, slight, uh, slight uh, twist to it. In the distance vector routing protocol, the distance is measured in terms of hop count. And what is this hop count? Hop count basically means like how many number of routers I have to cross to reach to a destination. So let's say I have to go to a certain destination and I follow this path. So how many number of times uh, I have to change my network? So this is one hop, second hop, third hop, and then fourth hop. One hop, second hop. Then one hop, second hop, and third hop. So four hop from here, two hop from here, and three hop from so whichever path like uh, has least number of hops in it, that path will be the best path. The point is similar kind of concept is used in the path vector routing protocol, but instead of considering router as the hop, they consider autonomous system AS as the hops. So let's consider this is an autonomous system. This is an autonomous system. This is an autonomous system. And this is an autonomous system. In this autonomous system, there are one routers, there are two routers, and there are three routers. Now, if I have to go from here, from this router number one, if I have to go from this router number one to this particular network, so how many number of hops, I, AS hops I have to cross here? Again, like one hop, two hop. From here, how many number of AS hops I have to cross? Again, one hop and two hop. So equal number of ASs I have to cross from both the path. So both the paths are going to be best. That's how I'm going to decide the best path in case of uh, path vector routing protocols. Path vector routing protocols are those protocols that consider AS as the hop. In fact, we call it AS hop. So path vector routing protocols are quite similar to the distance vector protocol, but protocols such as BGP looks at uh, a best path selection it does the best path selection based on this thing called path attributes and BGP risk metric instead of popcorn. BGP, border gateway protocol, uses the path vector algorithm to decide the best path to reach to a destination. And that path vector algorithm is going to use these the path attributes to decide best path to reach to a destination. One of the path attribute is called AS path. And this AS path attribute means if I have to go to this destination, how many number of ASs you have to cross? If I have to go to this destination, how many number of ASs you have to cross? So, for example, this router advertises this information to the neighboring router. It will include this AS number in the update message. It will say that if you have to go to this destination, the AS that you have to come to is one. When the router 2 receives this information and passes this information to the next router, it is going to keep that AS information and it will add its own information as well. Basically, it will form a list, list of the autonomous systems that the prefix has caused to reach to a particular router. When this router receives this information and advertises it to the neighbor router, uh, the information is going to include that if you have to go to this destination, uh, you have to cross like uh, AS number one, AS number two, and my autonomous system number four. When this router three receives that information, and let's say that the router forwards the information to router two or router number one, they are not going to accept it. Why? Because this router, when it receives the update, it sees its own autonomous system in the AS path list. When this router receives the update, it sees its own autonomous system in the AS path list, which is an indication that the prefix has already crossed your network, already crossed your autonomous system. 
you don't need to now accept it so path vector routing protocol they actually guarantee that the loops will not occur path vector routing protocol uses path vector algorithm which guarantees that the loop will not occur by keeping a record of each autonomous system that the router advertise that the route at routing advertisement has traversed so the update message has gone through this autonomous system so this as information is going to be there in the as path list any time the router receives an advertisement if which is already part of the as path list the advertisement is rejected because accepting that will efficiently result in routing loop so if i receive an update message and the as path list contains my own autonomous system i am not going to accept it if i receive an update and the as path list contains my own autonomous system i am not going to accept it because it will cause the routing loop so why we call them path vector routing protocol because these uh, uh, this this protocol bgp border gateway protocol it uses as path information to decide like best path and to prevent any potential loop in the network as well so path vector routing protocols path vector routing protocols use path vector algorithm which considers as as the hop and to reach to a destination whichever path has the least number of as hops i am going to consider that path as the best path so path vector routing protocols we use these path vector routing protocols we use these like path vector routing protocols or path vector algorithm in actually that is like border gateway protocol that uses this path vector algorithm path vector algorithm is responsible to decide the best path to reach the destination and also to prevent any potential loop in the uh, bgp environment right so these are like four algorithms one is distance vector algorithm second is linked state algorithm third is enhanced distance vector algorithm and the fourth one is the path vector algorithm uh, protocol such as rip uses distance vector algorithm eigrp uses the dual algorithm ospf isis they use linked state algorithm and the bgp protocol uses path vector al algorithm to decide the best path and also to prevent any potential loop that can be there any doubts anyone let me know any questions there are two things that you should remember and these are like very easy but uh, like uh, most of the people they do not uh, uh, understand it or they 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 they, may, they they do a lot of mistakes in this so let's talk about a few things from the best path selection point of view very quickly first thing first uh, you have to understand two things very clearly that uh, best path selection right and best route selection is two different thing one thing that you have to understand first of all very clearly that best path selection and best route selection are two different things you must understand that uh, when we want to forward the traffic when we want to like let's say this router has received same route information from multiple places like router 2 router 1 is giving it the route information router 2 is also giving it the route information the router 3 is also giving it the same route information which path will get installed in the routing table that is a complete different process that is a complete different thing than which path this router will take to route the traffic towards the destination network they look like the same they look exactly the same it looks like they are same thing it looks like the best path selection uh, to route the traffic and best route selection Uh, to install the route in the routing table it looks like they are exactly the same but there are a few uh, differences if i say so let's talk about quickly best route selection because until the route gets installed in the routing table routing will not take place so first of all let's talk about the best route selection if router has received same route from multiple sources the router has received the route from here from here from here which path it is going to select and install in the routing table first of all right so let me take a route and let me ask a few questions and let's see how well you understand it so there is a network the network is 10.1.1.0/24 router 1 is supposed to advertise this network information router 1 is supposed to advertise this network information to uh, let me call this uh, uh, like let's say for example router 4 so this router is supposed to advertise this information router number 1 is supposed to advertise this information to router 
router three is also supposed to advertise the same subnet information to router number four and router three is also supposed to advertise the same information to router number four now we we might have used some uh, things such as uh, uh, summarization or some things we might have used so the point is if this router advertises exact same route slash 24 slash 24 slash 24 router one is advertising the exact same route to router 4 router 2 is also advertising the exact same route to router 4 then router 3 is also advertising the exact same route to router number 4 that means CIDR the classless interdomain route in the CIDR value is the same if the CIDR is the same from all the path uh, what it is going to look next it is going to look at the AD value administrative distance value next we are just talking in general we are not talking about uh, OSPF intra inter and all those things we're not talking about that we are just talking about in general that if if like the if I'm receiving a route from multiple sources and everyone has the same CIDR then I'm going to choose based on the AD value which path is going to install in the routing table which path will be installed in the routing table so based on the administrative distance value based on the AD value based on the AD value first thing first based on the AD value it will install like which path will be the best one to be installed in the routing table and and let's say let's say the ad value is also same e eigrp is running so ad value is 90 ad value is 90 ad value is 90 so if the ad value is same from all the path then i'm going to choose this metric criteria from whichever path the metric is the lowest i'm going to decide that path has the best path metric again it could be hop count it could be cost it could be composite metric it could be anything let's say the metric also comes to be same from all the path then i'm going to perform equal cost multipath for equal cost load balancing this is how this is how the devices install this is this is what we think this is what we what what we know that this is how the route uh, the best route selection takes place and the, uh, the router selects the best path and installs it in the routing table. This is what we know. However, there is a problem in this one. This criteria is okay. This criteria is okay. This criteria is okay, but this is not okay. This is not here. This is not applicable here. This criteria is not applicable here. Point is, if router number one, router number two, and router number three, they are advertising router number one, router number two and router number three if they are advertising three different subnet masks router one is let's say for example advertising that if you have to go to that destination uh, you, you can reach with the subnet mask value of 24 router two is advertising you can reach there with the subnet mask value of 29 and let's say the router number three is advertising you can reach there with the submit mask value of 27 which of these three routes will get installed in the routing table First one, second one, or the third one. We always know what is what is what is preferred? Highest CIDR. This is the first criteria that you always take a look. We have we have we have all studied that the highest CIDR is the first thing that the router checks, and based on that, it takes the decision. So router one is advertising the same route on slash 24, router two is advertising the route on slash 29. The summarization we might have done. Router 3 is advertising the route on slash 27. So which one will get installed in the routing table? Uh, slash 29. This is actually incorrect. Because uh, this is not the same route anymore. This. 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 And this. These are not same routes. Think about it. This is a different range. This is a different range. This is a different range. These are not three same routes anymore. So again, which route will get installed in the routing table? It will, again, which route will get installed in the routing table? This decision is never done based on the CIDR. No. The thing that you guys have studied is based on the highest CIDR, the router decides the best path to reach to a destination. That criteria is not applicable when the route gets installed in the routing table. These, if, if the same route, if this exact same subnet was being advertised from router 1, router 2 and router 3, then it's okay. 
then the router will choose in between these three because now it will consider that okay this is the same route that i am receiving from three different sources but that's not the case here these are actually not three same routes these are three different routes and you can think about it if you if you can find the range apply your submitting concept and calculate the range calculate the range calculate the range and you will find that this is a different range different range different range so if a router receives three different cidrs it will install all of them it will not decide based on the highest cidr that okay this part is the best one that criteria is only applicable for traffic forwarding it is not applicable for route selection now all of these 24 29 and 27 all these three path got installed in the routing table so now when the packet arrives now this router will see oh based on the highest cidr i am going to choose this path as the best path to route my traffic but when it comes to like installing the path in the routing table that is not done with the help of cidr highest cidr wins only in case of best path selection to route the traffic highest cidr will not win in case of best route selection to install in the routing table that is one major difference that you should be aware of so here here best path selection is based on three main components one is prefix length ad value and metric best path selection not the route selection best path selection to go to a destination if i have to decide the best path and i have multiple paths to reach to the destination one is on slash 29 one is on slash 24 one is on slash 27 so which one is going to be the best one uh, the slash 29 one is going to be the best one and why that is going to uh, that is going to be the best one there is also one uh, reason behind the same because when the router receives a packet and the packet has to be routed like on either of these three path the packet has to be routed which path is going to be the best path the router has to decide so the router is going to take a look at the destination ip router is going to take a look at the destination ip router is going to uh, take a look at the routes that is available in the routing table and it is going to do a bit by bit comparison bit by bit comparison between the destination ip and the route that is installed in the routing table so where do i have to go i have to go to 10.10.1.7 uh, uh, i have to go to this destination i have to go to 10.10.1.7 i'm going to convert it into the binary and i have like three routes to reach to the destination route a route b and route c i'm going to convert these three routes in the binary as well and bit by bit i will i will compare like out of these three routes in which route most number of bits are matching like most most number of bits are uh, matching in whichever route that route is going to be chosen as the best path to reach to the destination so router is going to perform this bit by bit comparison to find out the best path to reach to the destination in whichever route the most number of bits match with the destination ip that route will be selected as the best path and it automatically becomes the path with the highest cidr so when it comes to traffic forwarding the first thing that will be that will be used is called prefix length or you call that cidr the prefix length represents the number of leading binary bits in the subnet mask that are in on position that means one so first thing highest the cidr longest prefix length like if i have to go to a destination and i have two route i can reach to the destination from here and here slash 29 is always preferred over slash 24 because more number of bits will match in slash 29 as compared to slash 24 you can also think it like in in this way slash 24 is going to give you like 256 number of total ips and slash 29 is only give you total eight number of ips so you can think like if you if you have to reach to a destination and you have to find the destination in these ips and this ip this is going to be much more faster from that point of view also you can understand why the highest cidr is always preferred if the cidr is same then only the thing will go to the ad lowest ad what is ad ad is the trustworthiness of the routing information source if a router learns about a route to reach to a destination from more than one routing protocol and all the routing protocol have the same prefix length 
all the routing protocol have the same prefix length, then the AD is compared. So whichever route has the lowest AD will get installed in the routing table. And the path will be selected as the best path to reach to the destination. And if the AD is same as well, then it will go to the metric. Metric means metric is a unit of measure used by the routing protocol in a best path calculation, such as hop count, such as a, a cost, such as composite metrics, such as path vector metrics and all. The metric vary from one routing protocol to the routing protocol and metric cannot be compared. The lower metric is always preferred. So see, here, routing process will start. The router will install the best route in the routing table based on AD value. It doesn't say highest CIDR. The routes get installed in the routing table based on AD value. If AD is same, then it will go to the metric value. If metric is same, then both the path will get installed in the routing table. But it does not say highest CIDR because that is not the criteria. Once the route gets installed in the routing table, when it comes to traffic forwarding, highest the CIDR is going to be looked up. Like if you have two paths, one on slash 24, one on slash 29, higher CIDR is always going to be preferred to forward the packet from one point to the other point. These are two complete different things. AD and metric. Like based on the highest CIDR, you are going to decide the best path to reach to the destination. Like whichever path has highest CIDR, that will be the best. If, if like we have two paths, uh, both have the same CIDR, then I will go to the AD. And if AD is same, I will go to the metric. If metric is same, then I'm going to perform equal cost multi path. So when the best path selection uh, comes into the picture, these are the three criteria that are used for the same prefix length, AD value, and the metric. And if everything is same, then equal cost multi path will take place. Let me know if you have any questions so far. What will happen in this case then? This is router one. This is router two. Like here we have a network, here we have a network 10.1.1.0, 10.1.2.0. The you can configure like any network in between them, doesn't matter. You can configure any network in between them. 12, let's say, for example. What will happen if I configure all the routing protocols? RIP. EIGRP, OSPF, in fact, BGP, static routing as well. In like route, it's not like we can configure only one routing protocol. We can configure more than one routing protocol. So on router one, I gave a static route to reach to the destination. On router one, I run RIP routing protocol as well. I have configured EIGRP, OSPF, BGP. I have configured all the routings that I know. Same thing I have done on router two. On data 2, I have given a static route to reach there. Then I have also configured represent 2. I have also configured EIGRP. So EIGRP neighborship is up and EIGRP is now exchanging the routes as well. OSPF neighborship is up and OSPF is also exchanging the routes as well. BGP is up and BGP is also exchanging the routes as well. So now the router 1 has a static route configured. It is also receiving the route via RIP, EIGRP, OSPF and BGP. So which one it will it is going to which one it is it will prefer it will prefer based on the AD value the static routing right if a static route goes down then it will prefer what EIGRP if EIGRP goes down then it will prefer what OSPF if OSPF goes down then it will prefer what RIP and considering this is IBGP now if it is IBGP then it will prefer later e as 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 BGP if it was EBGP if it was EBGP, then after a static, it will prefer BGP, then EIGRP, then OSPF, and then RIP. It is purely done based on the AD value. And you already know about the AD value. Okay. Now, you must also know that we can change the AD value on per protocol basis. So, on all the protocols, I have changed the AD value to 100. Now, what will happen? I have configured a static route with AD value of 100. I went in router RIP, distance 100. Router EIGRP, distance EIGRP 100. Router OSPF, distance intra inter 100. Router BGP, distance 100. Now what will happen? Metric cannot be compared. You cannot compare the metric value. So 
ECMP, uh, like we only have one path. How the ECMP will take this? We only have one path. So ECMP is also not an option. And uh, uh, j just in case if the router installs the route from all the routing protocols, so unnecessarily it is adding the routes in the routing table because only one path. So what will happen now? What will happen if I forcefully change the AD value for all these things, the static routing and dynamic routing protocols to let's say, for example, 100. CIDR is same, AD is same, metric cannot be compared for these routing protocols. The fourth, fourth thing was what ECMP. So will it perform ECMP or will still like it will do some, it will take some other things in considerations. So create a topology and find that out, right? You guys must already know since you are sitting in the CCI batch. So I assume that you must already know at least basics of EIGRP, basics of OSPF, basics of BGP, because it's already part of CCMP curriculum. You should also know rip from your older CCNA content. Just create a basic topology, configure the network and find out what will happen and why it will happen. Just to give you the hint, no, it will not install all the paths. It will install one of them. Which one and why? Just find that out by tomorrow. Ha, one more thing I forgot to mention that AD is vendor specific. The term AD, the term administrative distance is not you might not even see this term administrative distance on other vendor. The term AD administrative distance is specific to Cisco. In other vendors, we do not have this term uh, AD. We have things such as preference. We have things such as uh, uh, route preference. So the point is like the term AD, again, the term administrative distance is not, you might not see this term AD value on the other vendors. So whatever we call administrative distance in Cisco is referred to as route preference in Juniper, route preference in HP and preference in Huawei. And you can see for directly connected networks, the AD is always zero. For the static route, AD value is one in case of Cisco. In Juniper, it is 5. In HP, it is 1. And in Huawei, it is 60. In RIP, it is 120, 100, 100, 100. OSPF, 110, 10, 150, 10, 10. And so you get the idea. So AD is again, the term AD is a specific to Cisco, which also brings one more question. The question is, okay. There is again one question that comes with this picture. Let's say this is router number one. It is a Cisco router or okay. It is a, let's consider that as a Cisco router. And let's say this is a router two, which is a Huawei router, right? So this is a Cisco router and this is a Huawei router. Again, there is a network here. There's a network here. I have configured like two protocols. I have configured a protocol such as, for example, um, I have done here static routing on route or if you want to use a protocol, you can configure a protocol such as, uh, um, let's consider here as OSPF or ISIS or maybe BGP. Here also the BGP, okay. So we have configured BGP here, border gateway protocol. Here we have also configured BGP. Here we have also configured protocol such as OSPF. And here also we have configured the protocol OSPF. So two protocols are running. BGP is running and OSPF is running. eBGP is running and OSPF is also running. Means this route will get advertised via BGP and OSPF both. And this route will get advertised via BGP and OSPF both. As per router one, which one will be preferred? BGP one, because AD value is what 20. And as per router two, which one will be preferred? OSPF one, because OSPF AD value in Huawei router is comparatively less than BGP. 
So on one router, I have a route in my routing table from BGP. On other router, I have a route in my routing table with OSPF. What impact it will make? Will there be any problem in this situation? Of course, if I had only OSPF, only BGP, then it would not work. Here and BGP configured here. Routers, they are exchanging the information via OSPF and BGP, OSPF and BGP. Just for redundancy, so that if sometimes if OSPF neighborship goes down, I have BGP running. Or if the BGP goes down, I have OSPF running. But the, the, the problem is, these two vendors, they use different, different AD values. These two vendors, they have two different, different AD values. Uh, no, no, Shishir, asymmetric routing will not happen. Why? Because there's only one path. Asymmetric routing basically means now when we have like two paths, like one here, say, so there's only one path. So no, asymmetric routing will not take place. My question is, what exactly is the role of AD value? What exactly is this role of preference value? Does this has to be same? on all the routers, like router one, router two, or it doesn't matter. So to answer this, as long as you have the route in the routing table, it does not matter. AD is completely locally significant. What, see, your router has installed the route in the routing table via BGP. Your router has installed the route in the routing table via OSPF. It does not matter. It does not matter how the routes get installed in the routing table, as long as the route is there in the routing table, traffic will get routed. AD is completely locally significant to the router. AD will be used by this router to decide like which path is the best path to reach to the destination. Lower AD value is always going to be preferred, but that AD value has no impact on the other router. Other router can use their own set of AD values to decide like which path will get installed in the routing table. So it is completely possible and AD will not impact anything in this situation. AD, administrative distance value, will not impact anything in this situation. Yes, Swapnil. Yeah, then which uh, protocol it will be used? Because if AD is a local significant, okay, uh, for the R1, okay, once the packet is going to be sent to the R, R2, then it's going to be used BGP or OSP because if the AD is low. It doesn't matter. Think about it. It does not matter which protocol. Whenever the router needs to forward the packet, it does not matter. Like the routes get installed, route has installed in the routing table in via which protocol. All that matters that the router has the route in the routing table. So router one will install the route in the routing table via BGP and router two will install the route in the routing table via OSPF and still the routing and everything will take place. It does not matter. It does not matter if the router has installed the route via one routing protocol, another one has installed via other routing protocol. As long as you have the route in the routing table, everything will work fine. If you, if you again, just to just to uh, see, no, nowhere here, nowhere here it says that uh, routing protocol will matter. It just says install the route with the least or the lower AD in the routing table, and that's it. It doesn't say that routing protocol choice will matter. So actually, it doesn't matter. It will not matter which routing protocol the device uses to install the route in the routing table. AD is completely locally significant. So AD is used by the router to locally decide like, okay, if I am running multiple routing protocol, which routing protocol gets to install the route in the routing table. Once the route gets installed in the routing table, that's it. AD value is done. Like there is no role of the AD value in actual traffic forwarding. Actual traffic forwarding will always be done based on the route that is installed. Route is installed with the AD value of 90, 110, it doesn't matter. So here, there will be no problem. In this situation, there will be no problem. Right? And if all the criteria are same, then it will perform equal cost load balancing. As you know, router one has equal cost path to reach to the destination. So it can perform ECMP. It provides load sharing across the link. If more than one link is being used, uh, and all the best position criteria are same, such as, for example, this is an example of OSP of equal cost. So to go to this destination, we have like two paths, and from both the path, metric is same, AD is same. So CIDR is same from both the path, AD is same from both the path, metric is same from both the path. That means the router has equal cost path to reach to the destination. There's no difference in these two paths. The router will perform equal cost load balancing, which is also referred to as equal cost 
multipath. All the protocols perform equal cost multipath. However, there is a protocol called EIGRP that is also capable of performing unequal cost load balancing. Means even though even though there is a difference in the first path and the second path, I like we can tell the router, we can go on the router and we can tell the router that if the difference between these metric value is not that much, you can use both of the path to perform the load balancing. We as an we as an administrator can go on the router, we can tell this router to use both of the paths to perform the load balancing if the difference in the metric value is not that much. If the difference in the metric value is this, you are eligible to perform the load balancing from the second path as well. This is what we can configure on router number one in case of protocols such as EIGRP. We'll talk about that in EIGRP. What is the use of variance? So most of the protocols provide ECMP. However, EIGRP is one protocol that can be configured for unequal cost load balancing as well with the help of variance. Variance is just a way of telling the router that your metric values could be close. If these metric values are this close, you can consider uh, both the path to perform the load balancing. This is what we do by setting the, by changing the variance. Like if the metric value, I can say that if uh, your, uh, uh, the, the metric value on the second path is like uh, up to twice the first path metric, then you can use this path to perform the load balancing as well. I can tell this router that these metric values can be how close so that they can so that we, so that we can con consider these uh, uh, these you know we can consider these this path to perform the equal cost uh, sorry unequal cost load balancing so even though the metric is different uh, eigrp device eigrp can still perform these stands for dual so eigrp can perform the unequal cost load balancing with the help of the variance command we will configure this we will tell the router that metric values can be this close, metric values can be this close, and if the metric values are this close, then uh, you can actually perform the load balancing. So EIGRP is the only protocol that maintains successor, feasible successor, best path, backup path. EIGRP is the only protocol that can also perform unequal cost load balancing. Nowadays, EIGRP is also a protocol that can form indirect neighborship on the top of the other protocols as well, which is what we refer to as EIGRP over the top. No longer in our content, earlier it was in our content. And that is it. This is all that we need to know from the basic routing point of view.